this one's actually a little bit a little bit more crazy the brother calls us and he's like hey my uh my brother just got home he's got a pistol in his waistband he's got some explosives and he said he just burned his wife's house down and he smells like gas and told me to get out of the house so i don't die Can we show any of that in, into the YouTube episode, or is that fucking? I don't know. I guess we'll we can talk about it. <laughs> and he's on the phone with dispatch, saying like, "Hey, he's like counting down, basically, right?" And um, I can smell this like overwhelming odor of gas. I can see he's got a gun in his hand. It's a pistol, and and uh, I, I told Dan, I was like, "Okay, dude, I'm gonna fucking hit him with my tack light on my rifle," and he gets like. A nanosecond to drop the gun i hit him with the light he immediately spins towards us with the gun and uh fuck we just this start it was on welcome to mic drop the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings Ladies and gentlemen, as always, it's both an honor and a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the podcast. He's spent 14 years as an active police officer in Northern California, seven of which as a canine handler. He uh, currently teaches a class called Surviving Deadly Encounters and the Realities That Follow course uh, at seminars and to other departments all over the place, which is really the backbone of what we're going to talk about uh, today as he has been in a number of them. He is the owner of Schoberg Tactical Consulting. And I can tell you, no bullshit, Captain America is his fucking stunt double. I mean, goddamn, look at him. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Kyle Schoberg. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming. How, uh, I mean, do you get that all the fucking time or what? Like you pull people over, like you're out in town or whatever, like, what the fuck? Uh, Yeah, I do, actually. Um, I have a Captain America shield that somebody made me on my desk at work. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I do get that quite often. That's fucking awesome. Yeah. There's there's far worse dudes to fucking look like that's for sure. Yeah, for you look sure. Like Jack Black, you know. Yeah, like yeah, you could look like that. So I recently came across a hot sauce brand that, while I you know didn't used to really be a hot sauce guy, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more into into having them uh, and enjoying them. But I don't like just that traditional. It's just hot sauce that a lot of kind of the big traditional brands are that uh, that are on every table out there. Uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce is a it's a small kind of boutique brand up in uh, Canada of all places that uh, makes a, a bunch of different hot sauces that uh, like flavor profile wise fit with a lot of different things. I mean, whether it's eggs uh, scrambled or fried in the in the morning or uh, even like, you know, chicken or fish or beef, uh, you know, kind of some of the non-traditional foods that you would normally eat that I eat a lot of. Uh, and, and in, in the interest of trying to eat things, uh, that are, are cleaner, more grass fed, and, and frankly, just, uh, not quite as flavorful, uh, as, as some of the other stuff I, I've kind of turned to hot sauces to, to amp it up a little bit in this, uh, brand I, I've really taken a liking to what I like, uh, primarily about them is they don't use, uh, any thickening agents or water like most hot sauces do. It's all natural ingredients with no preservatives. Uh, it's all locally grown stuff uh, in all of their sauces. They ferment the peppers for, uh, I think, 45 days before uh, being aged um, or before made, you know, for, for that maximum flavor. So it really kind of enhances it. Um, and they're just really balanced. Um, one of the kind of unique things about them, too, if you saw the the way in between Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier, um, Dustin handed, handed Conor a bottle of hot sauce, and it's his... Uh, version or blend of hot sauce from this company, uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. So uh, they've got a bunch of really good flavors, uh, again, that I, I put on a lot of different things and really, really like their product uh, and, and reached out to them uh, in terms of partnering uh, with the show because, it's uh, it's again, it's one of those products that I believe in just like all of our other sponsors. So uh, if you dig hot sauce, whether it's, you know, pineapple flavored or traditional habanero, uh, you know, or even or Dustin's, you know, Louisiana style, they, they kind of have a, a flavor for everybody. So uh, really good stuff. Awesome company. Great dude behind the company and, and just a, a really 
uh, you know, cool, cool experience in, uh, in working with those guys. So uh, go check them out. They do have a promo code. Uh, it's just mic drop, all caps, two words uh, for any listeners to get 20% off all of their sauces. And that's good for six months. So again, mic drop, two words, all caps, 20% off. Uh, and that's good for a full six months. So uh, you go check them out. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just all around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American made, uh, all American sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house. And they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now. And I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd like to take a second to uh, shout out our newest sponsor, which is Project Warpath. This is a Navy SEAL-owned company uh, that provides apparel with a pretty edgy uh, feel. And uh, it's a good friend of mine that, uh, that runs it out of California. Uh, and just an overall a great outfit. Um, they've got a, a whole line of different shirts, uh, one of which uh, is, is arguably, arguably my favorite, which is Epstein Didn't Kill Himself. wonder where that one came from. And uh, But yeah, there's Hillary Clinton Killed My Friends. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, pretty edgy and cool patriotic sayings on T-shirts with, uh, with good design, good high quality. Uh, and it's one that, uh, that I'm actually wearing right now. So uh, I appreciate uh, them sponsoring the show. Again, that's Project Warpath. Uh, you can get all their stuff online and, uh, and you know, the shipping and customer service is top notch quality product and, uh, you're supporting a veteran owned business. So shout out to project Warpath, go check their uh, stuff out. I'd also like to say thank you to our other sponsor resilience premium CBD resilience is excited to offer all mic drop listeners, a 20% off discount on all products for two weeks from when this podcast is live using the discount code mic drop at checkout. That's two words, Mike drop at checkout. I'd also like to say that resilience is a great company uh, that works in conjunction with Trico CBD and all military veterans and first responders receive 35% off. Yes, that's 35% off for all military veterans and first responders. And that's uh, through the military and first responders program. You just have to sign up at resiliencecbd.com slash military first responders discount. Uh, in terms of about resilience, generally speaking, it's a premium CBD that I use. Again, it works in conjunction with the Tricos brand for the everyday athlete. Uh, that's www.resiliencecbd.com. And resilience was uh, really born with the founders who uh, are military veterans as well. Personally experienced the effects uh, and impact that CBD had on their own mental and physical obstacles. Their focus was sharper, mental stress was calmed, fitness stamina increased, and their bodies felt less pain, inflammation after super intense workouts. Uh, a lot of times, most people and, and people are able to either wean and off entirely or significantly reduce pain management, ther uh, pain management therapy. This is a shared vision among the founders that this uh, incredible supplement had not only changed their lives, but had the power to provide unbelievable benefits to family, friends, athletes, fellow veterans, and ultimately the entire fitness community. So big shout out to Resilience for their product as well as the Trico stuff. Uh, we sure appreciate their support. What's the funniest traffic stop you've ever uh, encountered? Funniest traffic stop? Shoot. Um, when I first started, uh, I was 20 years old. I had mentioned to you earlier. Uh, so super, super young. And I probably looked like I was 12. Yeah. Um, and I remember where I used to work up in Grass Valley, uh, it snows there. And, uh, I was doing patrol one night. It was pretty, pretty late at night and it was snowing pretty good. And, uh, traffic was getting backed up by this lady, uh, driving super, super slow, right? She's trying to be careful. So I end up, I end up pulling her over cause she was creating a hazard and, uh, walk up to her window and she's pretty old. And, and she looks at me and she's like, uh, She's like, hey, it's late at night. She's like, what, does your mom even know that you're out this late? <laughs> and, you know, I'm trying to be serious with her. Yeah. And 
uh, she did not take me serious at all. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. She, she punked me for sure. Did, I mean, did you get that often, uh, early on? Like, yeah, yeah, I got it pretty often, but, uh, that was, that was the worst. <laughs> That's got to be kind of a pain in the ass, really. I mean, because it's obviously a serious job. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, like, not to get too far in the weeds, and we'll talk a little bit more about, like, age restrictions, requirements, training, et cetera. But, mm-hmm. um, I mean, to me, like, what what do you think is the ideal age, um, or is there one that, that, that you should have to be? Because 20 does seem pretty fucking young. I mean, because you're out there dealing with people that, you know, are three, four times your age you know, that, that have a, you know, way more life experience to me. Like that's, that's the biggest thing that, that I think we allow cops as a society is, is to use their discretion. Like, and, and to me, discretion is a really powerful uh, thing that, that can be used for good or it can absolutely be abused too. So, I mean, what, what do you think the right answer is for that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, knowing what I know now, um, you know, I don't know that there's a specific age cap or limit uh, that should be put on it. Um, I think maturity and life experience, uh, should play a a huge role in that. Um, because yeah, like if you think about it, like you just mentioned, you can, um, you can ruin somebody's life um, forever, um, doing this job, you know, making the wrong decision. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, there's, there's that. Um, I, I, I really think it comes down to life experience, maturity, um, you know, to me, that, that's a hard thing to test for, you know, like for there's, sure. there's not really a, a standard that you can put on paper that, you know, cops just like military and, and, or big corporations like are so rule driven and by the book that it, it would be hard to, uh, to implement something like that. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that, uh, that police face, you know, nowadays yeah. is, is, is that, but, uh, what's your ideal service pistol? Like if you can carry whatever the fuck you want. Um, I carried a SIG P226 for a long time, uh, the 40 cal. Um, and we just transitioned over to Glocks, the nine millimeters, um, fairly recently. Uh, I do like that pistol. Um, I'm really comfortable with the SIG yeah. and, I, and I really like, I liked that. Yeah. So I, I would carry that if I still could, yeah. uh, but I can't. They, they give you zero autonomy to be able to carry what you want. Um, you can carry a nine mil as long as it's a nine mil. Oh, and okay. then there's certain brands. You yeah. know that that they authorize to carry, but um, yeah. it has to be a nine mil. What's uh, what is something that the public uh, would be surprised to know about police officers, generally speaking, that, that they maybe don't or probably don't? <laughs> um, it's a good question. Uh, probably that we're just just like anybody else, right? Like outside of the uniform, I'm a human being. Um, my heart beats like everybody else's, and uh, we do have compassion and, and empathy for people. Mm-hmm. Believe it or not. Um, I think that's probably the biggest thing is that we are people, yeah. um, and in uniform, people don't perceive us as that. Yeah. Um, but we are. Yeah. I mean, that's another tough thing is that, uh, you know, unfortunately, <clears throat> you know, every police officer from an institutional standpoint represents the entire institution, mm-hmm. Yep. you know, and it, and it only takes one fuck up, you know, it's the, uh, we had a, uh, saying that I, I, I know wasn't it didn't originate in the military, but as you know, Bob the bridge builder, you can bridge, you know, he can build a thousand bridges, mm-hmm. uh, but he sucks one dick, and that's what everybody knows him <laughs> as, you know, yeah. like, uh, you know, and, and that's just the unfortunate <clears throat> fucking part of it is that, uh, you know, that that's the thing, and there's there's definitely a, a handful of questions that I want to uh, explore uh, as, as we get more into uh, some of the policing stuff that uh, that I, I know I'm curious about. Uh, and I know a lot of other people are, but, uh, what is your morning routine, uh, on a typical day where you're just at home? Yeah, my morning routine depends. So if I'm working, I work graveyards. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I'm working during my work week, uh, I get home, uh, stay awake and then get my, my kids up, my daughter up. She's got to get ready for school. So I'll hang out with her for a little bit, get her ready, take her to school. And then, um, I'll come home and, and sleep, you know, for a few hours. But, um, my non-working days, I'll get up. You know, do you eight. stay on that schedule at all? Or do you no, know? hell no, Dude, that's no. Gonna fucking be horrible. Yeah, it is. It's it's terrible. I don't. Some guys do. I don't know how they do that. I on my days off, like I want to fucking go to bed at a normal time yeah. and be normal. So I do. Um, so I'll get up uh, around eight. I'm not. I don't get up super early, and then um, do breakfast. Uh, generally go to the gym by like nine nine thirty. Uh, get that out of the way, and then um, 
do shit around the house, you know, hang out with Steph yeah. and the kids. What, uh, what does breakfast look like and what type of workouts? Um, I'm not like a huge breakfast fan. Sometimes I'll just do cereal. Like yeah. I'll eat lucky charms. Um, <laughs> and, or, uh, you know, I'll do a kind of like a lighter breakfast yeah. and then, um, Cause lucky charms isn't light enough. Yeah. No, I love lucky charms. <laughs> I can't get enough of those. That's a fucking trip. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then I go to the gym and I do just weightlifting, standard weightlifting. Yeah. I'm not a CrossFit guy. I don't. Yeah. I'm not into that. Yeah. Do you uh, do you do jujitsu or any combatives like that? I don't. Um, I'm always surprised by that. Like I know, <laughs> cops of all fucking people. I mean, mil- military similarly, but even like to me that I, I can't think of a profession other than an MMA fighter where uh, where there's as much of a transferable, paralleled, applicable. Uh, element to doing jujitsu than being a fucking cop, especially given how <clears throat> how easy it is to to get fucked. You know, if you draw your weapon or taser, or, uh, especially here recently, thinking you're drawing one versus the other, which I want to talk to mm-hmm. you about. But um, you know, like to me, that's going hands on with people is is pretty common. You know, if it you, is. I mean, do you know how many times? Like, if you kept track, how many times you? Oh had, fuck! Like dozens, hundreds. I mean, well, every day at work, we're going hands on with people, yeah. right? Like, I mean. Um, you know, I work in a, in a busy city. So, uh, a lot of the interactions we have, like you are going hands on with people and control holds and in searches and stuff like that. So, um, I have, uh, I had a shoulder injury a long time ago. So I think, uh, that's a little bit to do with it, but I did wrestle, um, in middle school through high school. And I always find that anytime I'm in the, in a struggle at work or a fight or whatever, I always revert back to wrestling um, and ground fighting techniques you know so yeah that is true and a lot of guys i work with they do jujitsu religiously yeah um my buddy nate does it um all the time daily yeah that's Um, good yeah but yeah it's uh it's interesting with wrestling what uh did you make it to state or anything was that in california also um yeah so i did it uh like i said for about six years um i qualified for this national tournament in reno which Mm -hmm. is a big deal and I actually lost to this kid. I, if I would have beat him, I would have meddled, which is a pretty big deal. Uh, and this kid from Texas actually yeah, uh, sure. beat me. <laughs> yeah, so I didn't get a medal. <laughs> what uh, what weight did you wrestle? Oh, dude. My freshman year in high school, I was 103 pounds. Yeah. So I was tiny. Yeah. I yeah. was the same, same boat. Yeah. So 103 was like my freshman class. And then I think 112 was like the highest I got up to. No shit. Yeah. What are you weighing now? 195 yeah man that's fucking wild <clears throat> I, I, similarly like i was i was 5'4 104 as a freshman yeah when i graduated i was 5'11 145 yeah and uh, i mean my first navy id i was 5'11 147 and just you know over the last fucking 20 20 some odd years i put 50 or 60 fucking pounds on but um where, so where did you grow up in in that same area in northern california yeah i grew up in grass valley nevada city area which is about um it's about 40 minutes south of Tahoe, Tahoe area. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, it's kind of a rural area. It is rural area out in the country. Um, you know, small town, r- yeah. real small town. Yeah. What, uh, what was, what was that experience like growing up in that environment and, and as well as like, you know, family, siblings, et cetera. Yeah. So, um, I have two sisters they are older. Um, the oldest, did uh, that, did that get you laid in high school? I hope. Oh, well, there was like the, always the, uh, the, the golden rule my sisters had, and it yeah. was like, don't ever talk to my brother. Like you're <laughs> stay the fuck away from my brother. So they cock yeah. blocked you. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like that was, uh, uh, that was a conversation. I'm pretty sure that my sisters had with all their friends uh, yeah. that was like not allowed. <laughs> um, so I have two older sisters. Um, yeah, we grew up in grass Valley, uh, as, uh, when, when obviously when I was young, um, my mom and my, my dad, my real dad were still together. Uh, we grew up in a nice house. Um, I do remember uh, at some point, I think I was probably five ish. Uh, my dad uh, became, he was an alcoholic and then got addicted to pain, pain kills, uh, killers. Um, I think it was oxycodones. No, no shit. Yeah. He had a shoulder injury, had surgery from playing college football. And, and um, anyway, so he was addicted to that and became an alcoholic and he was, he was pretty abusive. Um, I remember he was really heavy handed with me as a kid. And then, uh, he would, um, you know, go after my mom and they'd get in some pretty, pretty hefty fights. Yeah. So I remember that, um, how old were you at that time about? Yeah, I was like five or six when that was going on. And I, I mean, I have like pretty vivid memories about it. 
um, to the point where like it would get out of control and, and, uh, my sisters and I would run across the street and, and call the cops, God, uh, run to the neighbor's house and have to call the cops and, and had it, they'd have to come and, and break it up. But, um, so I was pretty terrified of my dad as a young kid. He was a big guy. Um, he did martial arts and, um, yeah, he just was, uh, fuck. He was a drunk, abusive. Yeah. Um, he's an asshole. How long did that go on before they split up or, um, they, he ended up leaving. I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming, I, I remember my mom leaving him and taking us with her, mm-hmm. um, left the house. So that was probably when I was about seven okay. ish. Um, and so when she left him, um, I don't know what happened as far as, so I remember he got lived in this little piece of shit apartment mm-hmm. and he was like rock bottom. Like he turned into like a, a shit bag. Yeah. Um, but we would still go see him every once in a while. And even though he was like that, I still had this weird, like I still loved him and, and wanted to, I wanted to see him. Yeah. Um, so we would go see him. My sisters and I would stay with him every once in a while in his little piece of shit apartment. Um, and then, you know, that kind of started slowly weeding away. And then shit, I think I was probably seven, eight. And he, I remember specifically him telling us one time at his apartment, he's like, Hey, they're going to bulldoze this apartment complex down. I have to move. Um, I'll let you know where I'm moving to whatever. (laughs) That was the last time I saw him. He fucking left, left us, never talked to him again. And, uh, uh, he's dead. He died a few years ago. I found out. Um, yeah, but that apartment complex that, that he was living in that was supposedly getting bulls down, bull down is, uh, is still standing. Really? Yeah. And I always remember that. I'm yeah. like, fuck, he lied, yeah. you know, just to get out. Yeah, that's fucking, uh, so that's got to be tough. The, uh, there seems to be a, a strange recurring theme with a lot of guests that I have on that have uh, pretty rough fucking childhoods. You know, it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's an interesting component, I think, to, um, not not to say that I would uh, you know wish it on anybody or think that it's good. It's not. It's fucking terrible. But um, I mean, it's it's a polar opposite of of my childhood. It, my, mine was phenomenal. But um, but there there's such a a drive and resilience that I I see that uh, is kind of a common denominator with a lot of guests that way. That uh, that's interesting. But um, so once he was out of the picture. Um, was it just kind of full steam ahead with the three of you and your mom or did your mom start dating somebody or like, yeah. Yeah. So, um, my mom had to take care of all three of us, obviously. So she, uh, she was working three jobs, um, growing up, you know, so she had to work her ass off. What did she do? Um, she worked at a bank. Uh, she was a teller and a banker there. And then she worked at restaurants after that at night, you know, to, to make it so because she had to take care of us um and my dad wasn't giving us she wasn't giving her anything yeah um we didn't even know where he was so yeah so we spent some time with uh my grandparents um her parents would watch us a lot and while my mom could work um and then she ultimately ended up meeting my now stepdad who i refer to as a dad yeah um he's uh he's awesome he um he moved here from new zealand Really? Yeah. So That's his, cool. yeah, his sister was a nanny, uh, working up here in the United States and he flew over when he was, I think like 27 or 26 maybe. Yeah. Um, and, uh, liked it and just stayed in the United States yeah. do, doing his thing and then ended up meeting my mom, I think when he was 28. Yeah. Um, yeah. started dating her <clears throat> and then they ended up getting married and shit. He took care of, like, he took on all three of us plus my mom yeah. and raised us as his own kids. Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah, so it was a, it was a blessing, I guess, yeah. you know. What does he do? He owns a painting business. Oh, okay. Yeah, which is rough work. <laughs> yeah, no shit. Yeah, he works his ass off. I mean, that's an honest living. That's good shit. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, I know you wrestled. Did you play any other sports growing up? Yeah, so my my dad, my stepdad, Kiwi, uh, we call him Kiwi because he's from <laughs> New Zealand. New Zealanders are known as Kiwi. So we, we everyone calls him Kiwi. Um, his name is Steve, but that's awesome. yeah, he, uh, he kind of pu- started pushing me into sports at a pretty young age. Um, you know, he, and he's from New Zealand. So like, he didn't know he had to like read books on football, yeah. our football. Yeah. Um, Still and rugby. yeah, not, not rugby. He played rugby, but yeah. So he got me involved in uh, like peewee football. Mm-hmm. Um, he read the books on it and he started coaching. 
And so I played football for a long time, uh, wrestled. I did volleyball. Like, honestly, shit, I did a lot of sports except for baseball. Yeah. I, like, never did baseball. Yeah. I think I was fucking scared of getting hit by the <laughs> ball. I don't know. I never did it. Yeah. That's so true. I did a lot of sports. Was, was there one sport that stood out as being uh, kind of your, your sport or your favorite? Uh, I got into motocross racing. Really? Um, yeah. We, we got into that pretty pretty heavily. Um, like they bought, my parents bought a camper trailer. Like we were traveling all around California uh -huh. every weekend. I know a lot of people that have never done it wouldn't consider that a sport, but that is an <laughs> ass kicker. Dude. That's it's no joke. It is no fucking joke. Like yeah. if you watch those guys on TV, those pros. No, they're in phenomenal shape. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. That's wild. Uh, that's, yeah. that's fucking cool. I mean, it sounds like a hell of a, a hell of a turnaround upbringing wise, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. No, absolutely. At, at what point in high school did you, um, get the bug or decide that you wanted to uh, become a cop? Was there a point or was it after? Um, so my uncle, um, my mom's brother what is, was a police officer. So all growing up, he was um, a pretty big influence of mine. There um, in, in that town? Or? Mm -hmm, yeah, in that town in Grass Valley, yeah. So um, he had moved there, uh, got hired there. And so he was around a lot. Um, you know, he was kind of, he was another fa uh, father figure to me. Yeah. Um, probably has something to do with how you got picked up at 20 to, to get on there. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I'm pretty sure he had a hand in that. Um, yeah, yeah but, uh, so, you know, I did ride alongs with him and I, I always loved it. Like when he would come over to the house in his uniform, yeah. I just, dude, it was like, I loved it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's good. Shit. Yeah. What, uh, what was the process from when you graduated until you got on that, you know, two, two, two and year change plus, uh, time frame? <clears throat> Um, like if, if you could just kind of walk us through from when you graduated high school until you, yep. until you got on. Yeah. So I graduated high school. Um, I tried the college thing. Um, I, I hated school. And where, so uh, where did you go? Uh, to high school, no, to uh, college. college. Oh, this a community local college here, college up yeah. in grass Valley. Um, <clears throat> I did that for like a year, I think with my buddy. And then, um, one of my friends from high school hit me up and he's like, Hey, I'm living in Chico. Um, why don't you come move in with me and go to school out here? Party and I was school. like, I was like, hell yeah. Chico is, um, is a party. It's always one of the top party Dude, colleges. Yeah. It's yeah. And it, it, it is like, yeah. it's crazy. Fucking like animal house. Yeah. So I, I ended up moving there. Um, I lived with him and two chicks. So there was four of us in the house <laughs> in this little townhouse. And I went to college out there for a little bit. Were and they hot? No, like no, I went to high school with one of them and she was like a close friend of mine. Um, the other one, no, no. <laughs> Let's hope they're listening. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they were cool. They had their own boyfriends. So um, I like for, for, for everybody that doesn't know what Chico's like, like it's party seven yeah. days a week. Yeah. Um, you know, so if you're not like strict on your school, you're fucked. You're going to, you know, fall into that lifestyle. So yeah. um, I couldn't get a job up there. And there's so many kids like college kids in that. And it's a small town that like, yeah. I mean, it's, it's impossible to get a job. So like I was there for a year and I uh, couldn't get a job. I mean, I, I applied at Toys R Us and went to a fucking interview at Toys R Us and they're like, <laughs> I got rejected by Toys R Us. Yeah. So, yeah. um, I ended up, uh, I was like, I, I can't, I got to get the hell out of here. And so I ended up going back to grass Valley, moved back in with my parents. And, uh, that's when the job opening posted for the police department. And I was like, Fuck it, I'll, I'll try it. Like I was only 19 at the time. Yeah. And so I thought, well, um, I'm going to put in for it and I'll just do the testing, like not even thinking I was going to get hired, but it's worth a shot. Yeah. I just thought, fuck, at least if when I go for it next time, I'll like have a leg <laughs> up on everybody else. Yeah. And, and I ended up getting hired. Is there not, uh, I mean, I know departments vary, but uh, <clears throat> obviously there was not a, a requirement for, a bachelor's degree or, or any, I mean, no. was it just, you have to be 18, a citizen and not be a felon? I mean, is that, yeah, it was like, yeah, it was like 18 is the cutoff. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> that's fucking surprising. Um, it is. Yeah. What was the process like? Like once you got hired on in terms of an academy, like, is it a, a state run academy or a local one or what, like how yeah. long was your training from when you got hired on? What was that process? Um, so it's six months, the academy is six months long. Um, I had to move, down to Sacramento area, uh, which is where my academy was. And um, I lived with um, another guy that I was in the academy with. And uh, we had this little shitty apartment. We were making like like $14 an hour. 
yeah. while we were in the academy. Um, and it was six months, and then that was that was it. From there, coming back, uh, I'm assuming there's some sort of on the job training, mm -hmm. like where you got to jump in an apprentice type type thing. How long did that last? Yeah, so that uh, that field training program, <clears throat> that's um, gosh, I think there is probably like four months long. Um, so I did that. And like, no shit, like one week after I got off FTO, it's, that's what it's called. Um, I got into a really bad car accident. I got hit by a drunk driver responding to a call. Mm -hmm. um, and without a doubt, if I would have had a training officer in the car, it, it would have for sure killed him. Wow. Yeah. So from the time you get hired until you're running shit on your own is less than a year. Dude, it's like by myself. I Yeah, it was like less than six months from the academy. Um, but and I was, but like from being Joe Schmo, the fucking civilian to oh, being yeah. in uniform is less than a year. Yeah. I mean, to me, yep. as a, especially as a fucking 19, 20 year old, I mean, that's, I know that's dicey as fuck. It know? is. I yeah. Mean, it's crazy. I mean, I guess like th there's an element to it that is what it is in terms of the, you know, the, the public needs X number of, of officers. And, and so, you know, they're. You, you can only hire people that apply, but to me that seems fucking dangerous. You know, I mean, it's just goddamn. Like I know what I was like at, at 18, 19, 20. And that's how most kids are. You know, I would say I was even probably a little mature for, for my age. I mean, I went through seal training at 18, but, uh, <clears throat> but I, I just, man, that, that seems fucking like a lot for a kid that age to handle. It is. Um, and like I said, it's honestly like thinking back, I mean, I don't think anybody that age should probably be have that much responsibility. Did you find yourself thinking that at the time or were you like, this is awesome? Dude, no, I was like, this is fucking great. Like, and my buddies were like, I think a lot of people were like, how the hell are you a cop? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't fucking know, but I am, you know, I, I had a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, and cause I wasn't 21. Yeah. Um, I got to do some, uh, like undercover things in bar, like <clears throat> bars for the alcohol beverage yeah. control. Like do, like stupid things like go buy alcohol and see if they'd sell it to me. Yeah. They would use me for stuff like that. But I mean, so, uh, so since you brought that up, I'm, I'm going to get into part of it now, at least is that <laughs> like, to me doing shit like that is, is a good way for the public to fucking hate you guys. You know, I mean like the, the way I view policing, generally speaking, not being a cop, but historically being a pretty big fucking supporter of them, uh, is that stuff like that and traffic tickets and fucking parking tickets and not wearing a mask and fucking seat belts and, and bullshit like that. Like like for the, the portion of the population that, that is still very supportive of police officers, doing shit like that is a really good way to ruin like the one last bastion of support that you guys have, in, yeah. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Like to me, I, I think if you're stealing shit or hurting somebody, then you should get fucking arrested. Mm -hmm. All that other shit to me is is just like as a citizen that pays fucking taxes and, and uh, you know, gets pulled over for dumb shit. Like like to me, it drives me nuts that shit like that happens because it's like it, it, it seems like it's already hard enough, uh, you know, for for most cops to catch a fucking break or, or be looked at uh, even keeled. Uh, and then when when shit like that happens, like it, it makes the people that support you say, you know what, I don't give a fuck then. Yeah, because you know, it's just like because, you know, again, like let's say it's a a mom and pop fucking convenience store that, you know, sells you beer on the wrong night because they're just trying to fucking make money and, and it ruins their fucking life. You know, like to me, that's fucked up. Yeah, I no, I, I agree. Um, I mean, that's why I could never be a fucking cop because there's just <laughs> way too many things. Uh, you know, that, that are considered illegal that I just flat out fucking disagree with that like from a discretion standpoint, I, I, I use it all the fucking time, you know, and like there's yeah. very few things I would ever fuck with anybody about, you know, but I think it's, it's even more frustrating when, you know, shit's getting stolen and, and women are getting raped and kids are getting fucking abducted, you know, and it's, and then it's like some dudes pulled over in, in a fucking shady median at that dusk <laughs> fucking radar on you. And it's yeah. like, dude, don't you really don't have better shit to do than that? Like, meanwhile, yeah. we get some, that a lot. <laughs> some old lady's getting, you know, fucking hit in the back of the head and her purse stolen. And you guys are <clears throat> fucking with somebody doing seven miles an hour over. Like, like what's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, we obviously get that a lot. Um, you know, I mean, discretion is huge, right? So, um, you know, you, you can either be that guy and do those things. Um, and there are course guys that do that, right? Mm -hmm. Like some guys get hard ons on 
writing a lot of tickets. You know, that's why I'm not a motor officer. That's or a traffic guy. That's all they do. Yeah. Um, but I'm not a motor guy because I, I feel, I feel kind of like you do, right? Like when I, if I stop somebody and maybe they can't afford their registration at the time, like I've, I've been there yeah. where I haven't paid my registration because I didn't have the money for it. Um, I always, I use discretion on stuff like that. You know, um, I think it's just person dependent. Yeah. Um, you know, but like, I, I agree with you. Um, especially in today's climate, um, you know, who are you, who are you willing to harpoon and who are you willing to like cut a break to? Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I agree with you and it comes down to discretion. Yeah. I, I think for me, it's, um, you know, the obviously context is, almost everything you know yeah, like it is what type of car are they driving what mm -hmm. you know what's going on around it you know all, all that type of stuff that that you know adds pieces to the puzzle that, that gives you an idea but like for me on on an even more kind of principled level it's just a lot of the things that that are illegal i just don't think they should be yeah you and know, i don't i don't either i mean you know it's like i, I don't think wearing seat belts should be you know, not wearing seat belts or helmets or fucking speeding or not stopping at red lights like i get that there is a, a, a contingent or an element to that that is from a safety standpoint, but mm -hmm. uh, e even with we'll take speeding because that's probably the, the most relevant in terms of it being potentially dangerous to people it, is that, you know, 70 miles an hour, if you're not fucking paying attention or fucking 10 miles an hour, mm -hmm. you know, if, if it's a three year old and you're not paying attention it is plenty dangerous, you know? And, and so to me, it's just like, there, there's so many like cherry picked, this is a big deal, but this isn't, you know, type of things that, that just drives me nuts. Yeah. Uh, you know, as somebody who's been to war for this country and, and again, pays a lot of fucking taxes for, uh, the salaries of people that, that are doing things that you're just like, dude, you're not making any fucking friends by doing shit like that. And I guess it just, if it were me, I'd be like, I'd be trying to, uh, be the gray man as a cop as much as possible, you know, and, and, and yeah. put an image that, that was making us look as, as a group as good as possible. So that when you need that blue chip of fucking support, when, you know, the angry mob <clears> is trying to burn your fucking police station down, that, that there's still people that, that are going to help you out, you know? Cause like, like, I don't know, to me, it, it just, it fucking chaps my ass. But, um, from a, a department standpoint, I guess, um, is that how it's set up where like, do, do guys tend to gravitate towards, those positions because they're those kind of guys. Is there any way to, to combat that? Um, I, I think so. I, yeah, I definitely think there's positions within a police department or, or a sheriff's department that are geared towards like guys' per personalities and what they like to do, right? Like, do you want to go out and ground and pound on and be a street cop and do that? Like then do that, um, you know, dog handling, you know, the, the route I went. Um, and then there's traffic guys, you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, there is a safety component to some of it, um, but you mentioned gray area and like, I, I always talk about that with guys. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm like, dude, there is a, there's a huge gray area in this job. Like this job is not black and white. Yeah. And unfortunately, sometimes people treat it as that, like mm -hmm. it is black and white and it's not, yeah. um, you know, I operate a lot in the gray area mm -hmm. and I know a lot of guys that do, mm -hmm. um, but there are those that don't. And then those are the, those are those guys that you're talking about or yeah. gals. Yeah. <clears throat> but what, uh, and I guess from your standpoint as being a cop and having, having seen, you know, kind of the, over the last 14, you've been quite 14 years, I mean, quite a bit has transpired in terms of oh, a lot, you know, I mean, everything really like it's mm -hmm. a, it's a completely different world than when you joined, I imagine. Yep. Uh, what do you think that the right answer is? as far as what you guys can control um what we can control like, like what do you think uh policing generally speaking should should be doing that it's not to to help assuage the uh, the sentiment that seems to be rapidly growing out there because you you know you can't control yeah what you can't control so you know thinking of the things that you guys can do what what do you think those things are um i'm, I'm always i'm always pushing more training um, training is a huge one. I mean, the reality is, is most departments probably get, you know, a few training days a year, mm -hmm. right? And like, that's just not enough for what we do every day. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, interacting with, with the community, um, you know, which I think we do a good job of and most departments I think do, Yeah. but the reality is, is 
with all these cameras out there, um, people videoing cameras, you know, how media wants to, to put certain video footage out and yeah. not tell a full story. Um, you know, that has a lot to do with what we're seeing right now. Yeah. Um, there's always three sides to a story, yeah. right? Like your way, my way, and the way that things actually happen. Mm -hmm. Um, people don't realize that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so I don't have an answer for you. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. And to be honest, I don't know if anybody has that answer. Yeah. Um, but training proper training is like, I can't even speak enough of that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think you could probably, uh, resonate with uh, more so than most because your canine experience and, and i've talked about this on a few different podcasts talking about similar uh similar issues uh, or or this similar issue is, is selection mm -hmm. is it you know like yeah. one, one of the things that again from a canine standpoint like i run into it all the time i'm sure you guys do too especially with the, the crew that you run around with is that you know the the genetics and and the initial selection of, of the dog is everything you know mm -hmm. like if, if it's yeah. not the right dog you can train all day every fucking day and it's not going to matter you yep. know and the, and the thing of it is, is like people it's no different mm -hmm. you know that's why to me it's surprising you know 18 no fucking real college experience that's relatable to, to policing and they hire you mm -hmm. obviously you know you've done well and, and uh you know i'm not going to say you're you're an exception but like you, you're a good example of, of how it worked out but i'm sure that there are plenty that that it didn't yeah for sure you know and i think that that's the biggest thing is is selecting the right fucking guys you know which is hard to do but um i wish that they had a a more thorough process the same way that a good canine department selects their dogs like you throw every fucking thing at them mm -hmm. yeah we you know do. it's like hey this one isn't going to make it you know I, I wish they did that same thing with people like throw them in a bunch of simunition scenarios where they've got to make fucking life and death calls at the drop of a hat while they're under pressure uh you know and see how they they respond to things like that it, it doesn't seem like that really takes place no, it, it doesn't. Um, maybe some departments do, but I, I, I doubt it. Yeah, um, I mean, none that I know of. None that I know of either. Usually it's like a, maybe a physical agility test, maybe. Um, but usually, it, yeah, you, it's like an interview, yeah. right? And you don't, you can't really judge somebody off of that, but sometimes you can. Um, yeah, I wish they did those things as, as well. And, and that's part of my, my training, you know, program that I have now is like, is geared towards the, what you're just talking about. Um, but by that time, I mean, it's too late, right? Like you're already yeah. in the job doing it. So, I mean, yeah. I think one of the problems too is um, if people started doing that, I think you might see lawsuits and, you know, cities are always worried about getting sued yeah. in counties, you know? Um, you know, so I, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I wish they did do those things. Yeah, I mean, to me, that that's the only thing that, that comes to mind uh, on my end. Uh, again, not being a cop, uh, <clears throat> but but looking at it from the standpoint of I know what I do, like – to me, it just kind of, it's common sense. It stands to reason. Like, you know, if a dog is going to be doing this in the job, mm -hmm. I'm going to test this in oh, the yeah. selection process. So like, if you guys are going to have to wrestle with people and, and deal with people that are hopped up on shit, resisting arrest, like you may want to throw a few of those scenarios at somebody before you decide to hire them. I, I don't know. Like to me, it seems pretty yeah. fucking, I mean, it's com it seems common sense. Yeah. But, um, <clears throat> all right. So going back to your career and we'll, we'll get, you know, back into some of the, the politics of it, but I'd, I'd love to hear kind of how those first few years were. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, once you got into canine, like how, how did that whole process transpire? Yeah. So I don't know. My first few years were, yeah, I was a small department. So like I was like dealing with people I went to high school with and, uh, people I grew up with, you know, I, I really didn't, I loved the department and I love the guys there. I still do. I still talk to a lot of them. Um, but it was just, you know, I, I wanted to go, I wanted to like get into action and stuff and I just wasn't finding it there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then on top of just growing up there, I just wanted to get out of that town. Yeah. So I was, I put in, uh, I got on the SWAT team there. Um, and I think I worked there for about three years. I, I did the SWAT thing for a little bit. Did you get, get any SWAT calls? Yeah, we did. Um, I got to, uh, we did a lot of marijuana uh, eradication stuff. I mean, there's some like huge marijuana grows out there. Yeah. Um, and those are, those are dangerous because, um, I mean, you get guys from South of the border that go up to these grows and they get handed like an AK 47 or, or a rifle and, and they're told to protect these farms at yeah. all costs, you know? So <clears throat> we would do that and we would run into some of those guys. Um, and then, yeah, I had a couple SWAT call outs, you know, that we had, which, yeah. which was cool. 
Um, you get in any gunfights with any of those guys? No, okay. usually they drop those guns and take off running. Because yeah. when we showed up, they like they knew they were they were fucked. You know, yeah. they didn't want anything to do with it. Um, it has happened, yeah. right? Where like they would sh- shoot back. Yeah. Um, but no, not me personally. Um, so I left there after about three years and went to where I'm at now, which is a, a bigger department yeah. down in the city. And what what was that? Uh, transition like going from you know rural small to now all of a sudden yeah. was it like holy shit like thrown yep. into the lion's den a little bit yeah honestly like yeah it was fucking crazy like what was the first like holy shit i'm not in kansas anymore type of yeah situation what what happened um actually and this is how i got into canine so yeah that that did happen i was on training and i think i was i probably only was there for like a week maybe <laughs> maybe two weeks and i still had to go through this training program um and we go to this call of uh, uh, this like Seven Eleven was being held up by some guy. Sure shit, we get there. He's he's got a knife and he's like holding it out the cash register. And I'm like, holy shit, you know, like fuck, this is like what I see on TV. <laughs> yeah. And um, surrounded the gas station. He comes out. Um, I don't remember exactly how it played out, but nonetheless, I think he tried to run from us. And there was a dog there, and I was I was right behind the dog handler, and I've never worked around dogs before. Um, in fact, I had been bit by a little kid by a dog. So I was scared of dogs at the time. <laughs> and this shepherd guy was over the shepherd and dogs going fucking crazy barking. And I'm like, I was fucking kind of scared of the dog more, mm. more so than the dude robbing the gas station yeah. and, um, fucking lets the dog go and bites this guy. And, and then we all jump on top of him, and the dog never came off the bad guy. He stayed on the bite. And I, after that, I was like, holy shit. I was like, that was so cool. I'm yeah. like, I'm fucking doing that. Like, yeah. I want that job. Yeah. And I swear to God, ever since then, that's how I got into canine was that one specific oh, incident. Shit. Yeah. How, how long me. did it take from from when that happened until you actually got in? Um, yeah. So I once I got off training, I had to put in my time with the canine unit. And I asked those guys, I'm like, can I start coming out to training? I'll catch dogs. And they're like, yeah, absolutely. So I did that for like three years. While you were still a beat beat cop? I was still a beat cop. Yeah. Yeah. I was going to training every week on my own time. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Like I was working graveyards, getting up. I would sleep like two hours, get up. I was living like an hour away, drive down there to their training, put a suit on, and then just catch dogs and train with them every week for about two and a half, three years. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, that's fucking, that's good stuff. I mean, that, to me, that's how it should be because it, it, as you probably, uh, or I would assume you agree, is that like, that's something that, that does take years of, mm-hmm. of gradual experience to get good at it. I think a lot oh, of yeah. times, you know, that's such a, an instant gratification society, you know, people, it's like, well, I'm 19 and I, I want to be a fucking dog handler. It's like, it's like, you know, three months goes by and they're, and they're like, they, they want to be an expert, you know, or whatever. And it's just like, it, that takes a long time. Yeah. And it's not like there's only so much that you can retain at once too, you know, where, where it's like you, you've got to learn things and, and kind of let it marinate a little bit and then, and then continue to learn. And it's, it's a slow fucking process. But, um, during that three year period as a beat cop, were there any, um, super hairy calls or gun battles or anything like that, that you got into in the, during that time? Um, one, one sticks out, um, during my first, I was still on training actually when this happened, but, um, yeah, we go to this call and it was a shots, shots fired call and w- which we get a lot of, and a lot of times you show up and pe- people are gone or whatever. Yeah. So we go there and, and I think, cause I was on training, I wanted to go like the extra mile and impress my trainer. So I knock on the door of the lady that calls and she's like, points across the street and she's like yeah my neighbor over there came out and started shooting his gun off and i'm like oh shit okay and as we turn <laughs> around um there was three of us there and we turn around start walking in the middle of the street to go kind of figure out what how we were going to game plan this the guy comes out of the house and he's drunk and he's like he's like yelling at us and we're like hey you know show us your hands uh, we got our guns out and he's like fuck you and uh he goes, uh, I got a fucking 22 for you. And, and my partner, who's a super smart ass, he goes, Oh yeah, I got a 40 for you. And then no shit. The guy fucking pulls out a, like a revolver right out of his sweater pocket. And I immediately just ran for cover cause I expected him to start shooting. So I took cover behind this car. And t- to be honest with you, like, I don't know why none of us shot this guy. I have no fucking clue. We should, we should have, um, you know, he threatened us with it. Um, 
he held it down, pointed at the ground. And we had this kind of like stalemate standoff with them. I don't know, for about 20, 30 minutes, he ends up putting the gun down. Um, we end up arresting him, talk to him after the fact. And, uh, I guess a year to that day, his best friend was shot and killed by the police and he, he wanted to do suicide by cop. He, he wanted us to shoot him. Hmm. Um, during that fucking standoff, were you guys talking to him? Yeah, we were talking to him, trying to get him to move away from the gun because he set it down, but he wouldn't move away from it. And then his family came out and, uh, you know, fuck, we're yelling at them to get back in the house because now our backdrop is them, you know. So if we did have to shoot, it was a terrible backdrop. Um, yeah. They were freaking out. So it was just a kind of a chaotic thing. And then eventually, I think he got enough senses and ended up walking down to us and surrendered. Yeah. But, so for a case like that, what is he looking at punishment wise? Um, so yeah, I mean, we charged him with like negligently firing and discharging his firearm. Um, probably not a lot. I mean, I don't know what, what, where he is now, but I mean, that was a long time ago, but, uh, yeah, honestly not, not a lot. Yeah. So, I mean, that's another thing discretion wise, right. That like you could have thrown a lot more at him, right. But you didn't. Yeah. I mean, we could have killed him. Right. I, but I, I mean, even, even from not killing him standpoint, um, you know, like you could have, you know, threatening a police officer or fucking, I mean, there, there's a lot of things that you could have, have tacked onto that. So I guess, you know, my, where, where my curiosity lies is, is in that, is it the context, uh, the context or the contextual association around him that dictates like what you guys decide to do or, or I mean, is it like, yeah. why, why him? Why didn't you shoot him? Like, why, why did he only get that versus some guys you, you probably would shoot? And then, like, what I think that's where where the public has kind of the what the fuck. You know, it's like yeah. there, there's some guys that, you know, same same exact fucking scenario that guys are going to get shot and killed doing that. And then sometimes not. You yeah. Know, it's well, like what what dictates that? I mean, you know, I've, I've been in shootings now and I can probably say that had that happened now, um, it pro probably would have been a different outcome. But, and I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, if, if guys that have been in shootings or some type of lethal scenario, um, are now comfortable, like doing, doing that, right. Mm -hmm. Like I'm comfortable being in a lethal scenario. Yeah. Um, whereas back then that that's never happened to me before. Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, you're talking about taking someone's life. That's a, that's a huge decision. Yeah. You know? So, yeah, I mean, so that, that's an interesting point you bring up, uh, I, I think, because it's, um, you know, to me, it sounds like it's less about discretion and more about experience. It is. Yeah. And a lot of it, it I, mean, I think probably 90 percent of it is, is about like what you're comfortable doing and what you're like. Yeah, your experience. Yeah. How much of of the cell phone judge, jury, executioner component of our society uh that exists how, how big of a role does that play in your mind when things like that are actually developing is it there or is it you don't have time to think about that kind of shit you know depending on the scenario but like if shit's really going down zero yeah. percent i that's like not even in the back of my mind yeah um, is that something that, that you think a lot of guys think about though yeah. outside of that like just interacting mm -hmm. with people and absolutely yeah. like you know so if you watch some of these videos that are online um, you're like, why the fuck did he do that? But then the, an the answer is <clears throat> they probably did that because they knew they were being videoed. Like I've seen videos of cops just getting like, there was a video going around of these guys in New York that just were getting water dumped on them. And I don't know if you saw that, yeah, but I, did. I was like, why that shit should not happen. Yeah. But it happened because they, they knew they were being video recorded and anything they did, it was going to get, they were going to get scrutinized for. Yeah. Right. So they just took it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, guys do think about that stuff. Yeah. Um, but, and you have to, yeah. right. You obviously have to, but there's a certain point where you do have to do your job. And as long as you're doing your job professionally and, and safely, and you're not stepping outside policy or the law, then I don't give a fuck what you film me doing yeah. because I know to operate within those parameters. Yeah. And I expect everybody I work with to operate within those parameters Yeah. and you shouldn't have any issues. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's for sure a good point i am curious uh because it, it just came down uh yesterday or the day before um the, yeah uh, george floyd thing mm -hmm. what, like to me again like I, I understand you know having been in in the exact same position but overseas 
to where I know, like, if we were being videoed, it's a different story, you know, the way things pan out yeah. and what, what have you. And, and just, and especially when, if we were being videoed at one angle and, and one splice of one clip, you know, d doesn't tell the whole story on the same token. I don't know how you watch that whole video and be like, okay, that, that that's fucking wrong. You know what? But I am yeah. curious. I, I try to reserve judgment, not being on the jury, not knowing all of the facts, you know, but it is like, it's one thing if it's 10 or 15 seconds of a video, but when it's like seven or eight minutes, like t to me, it's, it seemed pretty goddamn excessive, but yeah, I, I am curious you, you, you know, having been in similar situations, what, what was your thought process in seeing that and seeing this whole thing unfold? And, and do you ever find yourself trying to reserve judgment of saying, even though I've been there, I wasn't there. And so I'm not going to fucking judge because I don't, I don't know the whole story. Or, or what, what is your take? <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, guys like us, we, we like to Monday morning quarterback every a lot of people, um, which, you, you know, it's it's easy to do, but you shouldn't. Um, yeah, like when I watched that, I thought, OK, it seemed pretty standard to me. You know, the guy was fighting. He's a big guy. He's, they're controlling him on the ground. But but when 10 minutes goes by and, you know, his knees and his neck, I, I mean, at what point? Well, especially like, if the dude's like to me, once a guy's handcuffed. Yeah, he's not I mean, even fighting anymore. Yeah, yeah, I mean, not that they can't fight because. I've seen guys get the shit beat out of them by somebody in handcuffs. You know, mm -hmm. I, I know that it can happen, but, but yeah, I mean, if, if the dude's face down, like to me, it's just like, man, like, is there an ego thing totally. at play there? Or, you know, like what mm -hmm. and, and why, like, why is that such a big fucking problem? Uh, so I think, yeah, for sure. An ego deal. Right. Like, and I think they had said he, that guy, that officer has been in trouble for, for his attitude and, and stuff in the past, but I contribute some of that ego and his attitude towards the public when they were telling him to get off of him, you know, he's yelling at, at the bystanders. Um, he's been doing that job for a while and he's in that atmosphere where, you know, he gets motherfucked every day yeah. at work, right? At some point that gets old and you do develop an attitude towards people yeah. because nobody wants to be treated like that, especially when we're there to help you. And then you want to motherfuck us, yeah. you know, and we're and you're getting it from all, all angles. Yeah. I think that had a, a huge part in it, um, his attitude, um, and just doing the job for, for that long of a time. And he's yeah. just fucking tired of it. And then his ego got the best of him and he shouldn't, he should have let him, let him up, yeah. you know, but he didn't. And yeah. now he's paying the price for it for yeah. sure. Do you, do you think that the sentencing again, I mean, I know you weren't on the jury, you don't have all the facts, <clears> but <throat> I think your perspective is, is probably a little more in depth than, than mine or anybody that's not a cop would be. Do you think that uh, that the charges and the conviction are fair, just, adequate for for that? You know, I don't, I don't know how their laws are, but um, I'll, I will say this: like, if if twelve member, if twelve jurors found him guilty, and there was no question that they did in a pretty short amount of time, um, then the evidence is there. You know, I didn't, I didn't watch that trial. Honestly, I watched like very little of it because I'm just kind of like tired of hearing about it. You know, yeah. like the guy fucked up. He painted a bad picture for all of us. We're all paying the price for it yeah. and have been since that. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah, I think he, he got what he deserved. Yeah. You know, if that's, if he's the cause of his death, then that's what he deserves. I mean, period. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, I think I think that's a good uh, good perspective to have, uh, and, and you know, it's to me. It, it, I'm always curious and fascinated by uh, you know what people that are peers of that no different than when something happens to to military folks that mm -hmm. you know, that I can relate to. Um, you know, a lot of times people ask my opinion on it. But um, all right, so back to you get into K nine. Uh, did that scratch that itch? Like when you got there, you're like, "Fuck! Finally, this is awesome." Oh yeah, you have no idea. Um, I got passed up one like six months before that I, when I tested, uh, I was like devastated. But when I finally got it, yeah, I was like, yeah, I can't even describe to you because I wanted it so bad. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, when I got it, it was like, fuck, finally. Yeah. Put in a lot of work. Yeah, no, for sure you did. I mean, and that's that's how it ought to be. Uh, <clears throat> but because I think I don't think I know I've I've seen it. I've worked with a lot of departments uh, over the years all over the country, both, you know, police and military. And, you know, you can tell in, in 10 seconds of meeting a, a handler if he likes his fucking job or not. Yeah. You know? And uh, yeah. And, and you, fuck, you can tell, by the way, his goddamn dog looks at him, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how he acts around him. Uh, you know, if he's been voluntold to be in that position or if he's put the yeah. time in and, and loves where he's at, you know, and, and that's 
unfortunately, you know, there's there's plenty of dudes that fall into that former category of, you know, it's like, hey, you're you're a fucking handler. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and that sucks for, for the dog, for the unit, for everybody. Yeah, that's it, not good. You end up half-assing it. But, uh, what, uh, what was your first dog? My first dog, uh, Dax was a Malawa. He, yeah. uh, yeah, he was two years old <clears throat> when I got him. And so, uh, when you first met him, was there any, uh, any funny stories of him, uh, like dragging his nuts on your pillow or pissing on your wife or like um, any fucking. Yeah, he was super cool at home. Really super high drive dog. Um. Cool dog. Uh, I loved him. We had a different trainer back then, and his style of training, um, to me, I, I, it, I didn't like it. Um, obviously, I didn't know any different back then, but um, I really, we kind of, we screwed that dog up. Um, a lot of compulsion um, on him, mm-hmm. on the e collar, uh, and, you know, get working on his outs and stuff. Like the way we were doing that, to me, was like, we were really hard on the dogs. There was like zero positive reward for the dog. Hmm. And I, I could see the change in this dog just progressively going downhill. And then he became extremely aggressive. Like that dog was fucking crazy. Um, Did you ever have any uh, issues with him? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I would show up to calls to get him out of the car. And like I said, you know, we're, we're busy and we, we use our dogs a lot. And, um, I'd get him out of the car and he would lunge out and bite me every time. (laughs) So I got to the point where every fucking time I'd get my dog, my own dog out of the car, I was like, fuck. And I'd have to like hide behind the door, open the door and he'd fucking lunge at me and I'd have to catch him. And a lot of times he'd bite me in my, my shirt or my arm. I mean, it got to a point where after about three years, it was out of control and we ended up transitioning trainers, which we'll get into that. But, uh, good dog. Like if I sent that dog out to find somebody, he was going to find you and he fucking destroyed people yeah. when he found them. How I many, mean, how many bites did you get with him? With him? Like 25 ish, 26. Yeah. Um, any of them like uh life altering, disfiguring? Yes. Most yes. Of <laughs> um, most of his dog bites, they probably required surgery yeah. afterward. Um, one in particular incident, um, we were chasing this guy for a while and, uh, found him in a backyard, uh, completely ripped his bicep out um his tricep got ripped out <clears throat> and then his artery he got him in the artery up here no oh, shit the oh yeah he i mean he was just i was like oh fuck we killed him and um luckily my partner freaking threw a tourniquet on his arm and honestly that saved him because the medics were like dude if you didn't put that tourniquet on him he fucking, fucking would have bled out yeah. yeah do you remember the uh the guy that uh I, here's another just a quick totally off topic Mm -hmm. question suspect yeah but to me like that seems like a ridiculous term to call somebody like if if you're catching that like he's not a suspect the motherfucker's doing it yeah Uh, you know but uh (laughs) call him a doer yeah i don't know a fucking criminal i mean but yeah so in in that case do you remember what the circumstances were uh in terms of why he was being like what like what did he do yeah i remember it yeah what was it um we uh, th- uh basically he was drunk and and tried running someone else tried running one of our um like uh city workers was cutting a tree down or something in, in the middle of the road. And like, he, he tried running him over. And so when some officers got out there to, to contact him, he took off in his vehicle. Um, anyways, <clears throat> we ended up getting this long, long pursuit. And then I ended up getting, being the number one guy in it. Um, he, he at one point like tried running me over with his truck and he tried ramming another, or he did ram another police car. So it was just this wild chase with him. Yeah. Um, he was fucking dangerous. And then he, he crashed his car. I don't even know how he lived. He was probably doing like 80 miles an hour and just fucking head on into a tree. Jesus. And he got out and ran on foot. I couldn't believe it. He was driving a diesel Chevy Duramax. And the thing was, yeah, and it was fucking crumbled and he gets out and runs. (laughs) I'm like, yeah. So anyway, so yeah, he, he, I think he got like 12 years in prison for that. Wow. For that specific call. Yeah. That's fucking wild. So, I mean, to me like that, that reverting back to you know one of your first things to do do with a gun you know do you remember what he got for that uh <clears throat> the guy with the gun um i don't, I don't remember to yeah. be honest um I, I have no clue i mean generally when we book people in jail and you do your report or whatever and it goes to the district attorney's office like you really don't know what happens with it after yeah. that you Most know I mean, yeah. yeah i don't yeah um in, in that case uh i'm assuming he was in the hospital for a while uh oh the the second guy that the car chase guy uh yeah he uh for sure he was he uh 
he had to have surgery. They had to re completely remove his bicep and his tricep. Yeah. Um, they had to fix his artery. And then, yeah, he was in the hospital for, for a while after that before we could remand him back into custody. Yeah. yeah. In, in a case like that, is that uh, because it's a police dog that does that? Is the department on the hook insurance wise to pay for his surgeries? How the fuck is um, that? Yeah, no, they're, they're, they are. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we're on the hook for some things, but, um, yeah, their actions caused that. And so, I mean, that's on them. Yeah. Um, that's but, interesting. Um, but yeah, Dax was a wild, wild, good dog, but yeah. fuck. How long did you have him for? Uh, three years, two and a half, three years. And, and it was, uh, so he's five, five and a half. Did you guys kind of wash him out because of the issues or what? what? So, <clears throat> yeah, we, my canine sergeant um, took over this. He's a prior handler, took over our team. And um, he's like, yeah, we're not. He wasn't fond of this training. Like the dog was so out of control um, that our trainer at the time, he's like, oh, we're going to hang him from a tree. Yeah. And my and I'm like, fuck, what? And my canine sergeant's like, what do you mean you're going to hang him from a tree? And he's like, yeah, we fucking hang him from a tree until like near death and then bring him back and you know, dominate him or whatever. And I'm like, and he's like, you fucking do that to that dog and I'll arrest you myself. He's like, you're not, you're not fucking touching that dog. Yeah. Um, it's it, fucking mind boggling. Yeah. I mean, just old school training. So, um, my canine sergeant was, um, good buddies with, uh, Greg Tawny who owns DTAC now. Um, Greg was working for a different company. Um, and he branched off on his own, started his own business, which is DTAC canine. And, uh, we ended up, moving over to his training and Greg saw these issues with the dog and, and he's like, dude, we can't like, we can't fix this, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and then that's when I got rid of Dax. Yeah. yeah we retired him. Where did he go after that? Do you remember? Yeah. So I took him to this place. Uh, this guy used to be a, a handler, a older guy, and he takes in dogs. Yeah. Um, you know, similar to what you do. Yeah. Uh, he's got a, like a 2000 acre farm. Oh, that's and cool. basically I took the dog out there and he's now like a farm dog. Just, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, just living the life. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's amazing. The uh, you know, and the dogs that we've taken in for the Warrior Dog Foundation, many of them are in that same boat, mm -hmm. and that they were high drive dogs that were, uh, you know, genetically a certain way, and and just frankly, fucking handled and trained what I would say improperly Poorly, yeah. for for too long, and uh, and got to the point where yeah, they're just too big of a liability and. You know the the unique and 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 neat thing I think about the position that we're in is that there there's no expectations or timelines. Yeah. You know, so we can use food to just kind of unwind the dog. Like mm -hmm. you're not asking anything of them. I mean, just something as simple as like, um, you know, the technique that that I, I mean I, I recommended it for my online training. I, I do the same thing with personal protection dogs. Any dogs that I get in, like when I first get them in, you know, I'll take whatever their food ration is for the day, put it in a Tupperware. If it's raw, it's in the fridge. If it's not, it's on top of their crate. They're in a crate. I get them out, <clears throat> let them out in the back uh, or in the property, depending on which, which one I'm at or whatever, and uh, and and just walk around and fucking ignore them, you know, yeah. and, and let them do whatever they want. And mm -hmm. anytime they make eye contact with me or, or come over towards me, I mark it and, and feed them. And I turn around and walk the other fucking way, you know, and, and doing that for even just a few days, but especially a, a few weeks, like, it's astounding uh, the difference that some of these dogs that before, like if you grab them by the collar, if you fucking try to put them in, in a kennel run or you try to crate them, like they're going to bite the fuck Get out bit, of you, yeah. you know? And, and now like they're running into them, into crates, kennels, whatever, spinning around. Not all of them. I mean, there's certainly dogs that, that have come in that uh, it's like, yeah, this dog is legitimately a fucking basket case and, mm -hmm. and we're going to have minimal success with them. But I will say that, like there's a handful of those, you know, we've taken in over 200 dogs in the last, you know, 10 plus years. And, uh, and almost all of them just by unwinding their mind a little bit and kind of fucking hitting the reset button yeah. by, by turning them around that way. Most of them can be, can be re rehabilitated. Some of them, it takes months. There's been a few that's even taken a couple of years. Uh, but you know, we've had a number of them that we've been able to, to repurpose and, and send back out to, uh, to departments by by doing that with them but uh it it always fucking pains me to see dogs come in it's just like dude this was such a good dog that was yeah. just fucking ruined by by ego human error a lot of the time you know it's not it's um, not the dog it's no it's i mean almost all the train time, them you know well i mean yeah. to me ultimately it's it's all human error because yeah. they're all bred by us 
Yeah. You, you know, uh, bred, raised, trained, selected, you name it, you know? So, I mean, at the end of the day, like that, that responsibility <clears throat> falls on, on human beings, but, yeah. um, all right, so you uh, you transition him out. Uh, who, who is your next dog after that? Uh, I got Axel, which, okay. who's I have him now. Um, yeah, he's a black shepherd, okay. all, all black shepherd. B- before you get into Axel, can we uh, take one step back uh, mm-hmm. back to Dax? Uh, were there any other really cool fucking bite stories? Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of them. Um, and I guess, <laughs> like, well, go ahead. No, I was going to say he, uh, I mean, he bit some cover officers uh, sometimes too that, like, <laughs> I, so... Yeah, I, I, I got on the SWAT team with um, with Dax, and I became the skids dog, which is uh, SWAT and canine, you know, interacting with each other. So I did that. I went off to, to skid school, um, and I went to skid school with Dax. And, like, my first day, we're doing these room entry, entry drills, and there's other SWAT guys there from other departments. <clears throat> and this poor guy, like, I probably shouldn't have done it, but I deployed the dogs through the window, and I downed them. And I sent this other SWAT guy through the window and fuck, <laughs> as soon as he goes through the window, my dog fucking latched onto his leg, sent him to the hospital fuck. for a day one. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we got a guy in an attic one time. Uh, it was like middle of summer. Uh, this guy was wanted for like raping, raping this gal. And he, he was a pretty violent guy and, uh, we, we were going to get him. I mean, like he, we weren't going to leave. We knew he was up in the attic. Uh, and I don't like doing addict deployments. It's, it's super dangerous with a dog. Yeah. I don't like it. Um, but um, I Dax was a smaller mouse, so I launched Dax up in this attic. And fuck, it must have been like, I, I swear it took him like two seconds. He found him immediately. And I just hear screaming. And so now, now I'm having to go up there and get, get him and this dude. And he was pretty jacked up from the dog. And I mean, he had like insulation all this nasty shit in his dog wounds. God it was damn. fucking super hot. Like I was like, dude, you're an idiot. <laughs> like fucking you're dumb. Do you guys have a policy of having to call out? Like, yeah. Um, of having to warn them. Oh yeah. Like generally, you know, unless you think someone's armed. Yeah. Um, yeah. We always give canine announcements and that's the thing is like, dude, we're always at, you know, yeah. given our canine announcements they can hear it. Yeah. The dogs are barking. They know they're there. And yeah. I swear like nine out of 10 times, I'm like, dude, why didn't you come out? Yeah. And they're like, fuck, I didn't think you were actually going to let the dog bite me. <laughs> what but, the fuck do you think he's going to do? Yeah. I'm like, but after the fact, when guys get bit, yeah. <clears throat> they're just like awestruck. They're like, holy fuck fuck that hurt so bad yeah i um, had no idea they could do that oh yeah. no way and they're like dude i i've heard it so many times they're like dude that dog is so badass <laughs> i'm like <laughs> Just i'm like the thanks fuck out of him. yeah uh, that's fucking wild <sighs> but dude you bite a guy one time yeah he's yeah. never fucking no. fighting it again oh hell no we've yeah. stopped we've come across guys that are like fucking i give up yeah. don't fucking let me get bit and they'll just be like dude i've been bit before i don't i don't want that again <laughs> That's a, that's an effective countermeasure. Um, yeah. were, were there any other, um, like big, big ticket or high value suspects in terms of, of what they did here? I'm using the term suspect again. Yeah. Uh, any, any fucking shit bags that, uh, that, you know, ha- had like a, a crazy rap sheet or, you know, fucking murder or, what, or whatever. Um, any, anything like that, that, that you um, got with them? Yeah. I mean, we've definitely, we've gone after homicide guys. Um, cause to me that there's, there's a, and, and maybe this is the wrong attitude. I'm I'm happy to take the fucking the heat if, if that if that is the case. But to me, when it's something like that, like a dude, you know, just molested a child and took off running and raped somebody or murdered somebody, and, and like you know, it's him. Like mm-hmm. there, there's no no debating that. Like to me, there there's a an element of kind of that instant primal fucking justice right away that you're getting yeah. fucked up by a dog and you deserve it. You know, like yeah. I, I get that judicially, like that's not really the right attitude, but just as, as a man, as a, as a fucking human being, like it's impossible for me not to think that way, at least a little bit. Yeah. I think, I think probably we all do, but like, again, you know, we're, we're professionals out there. So, I mean, we don't, we don't definitely don't talk about that and we don't let that show. Like we have a job to do. Um, and we are going to be professional yeah. throughout the whole thing. And, and we are, um, yeah. but l- l- I'll put it this way. Like every person that we send a dog after they're all violent. I mean, we're not sending our dogs after guys that have, you know, stolen a candy bar from a store and took off running. You yeah. know, these are all, um, guys that have been involved in some type of violent encounter. Um, 
they're all violent. You know, that's, that's our policy, you yeah. know? So is, is that a, a, a mandatory box that needs to be checked for a dog yeah. deployment? It has to be a violent, mm -hmm. really. It has to be a, yeah, some type of violent act, um, mm. or they they have violent tendencies, you know, past arrest history, stuff like that. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it before yeah. you just deploy a dog yeah. for those reasons that we just talked about. I mean, the injuries are so pretty significant. Yeah. Um, yeah, you're not just biting anybody. Yeah. I, I know, you know, department to department, that that's another one of those things that departments as a entity have their own discretion. Yeah. And, and some departments are like fucking bite everybody, you know, and other ones are yeah. like, if you, if you bite somebody, there better be 30 fucking boxes checked before you send that dog. And even then, like you're <clears> going to be <throat> investigated and everything in between. Like I've always kind of wondered why uh, there's such a disparity between departments that way. Like, and, and I get that, each department is different. You know, the, the people they're up against are different. You know, yeah. the, the podunk fucking Kansas rural, you know, sheriff's department with five deputies is very different than fucking LAPD, you know? So it like, you can't yeah. have a cookie cutter response, but I, I would still think that there, there would be some continuity, you know, canine unit to canine unit. And, and there just really seems to not be, but what, what's your take on that? Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with liability, yeah. right? Like, I mean, a, a canine, one canine bite can, deplete a department you know you talk about like a small agency um sometimes those pay out millions of dollars lawsuits yeah. you know like if it's an accidental thing <laughs> yeah if it's accidental or even if it's a good bite you know people can still file lawsuits you know yeah. uh, so anyways i think it has to do with liability you know how busy is it where you're working are you using these dogs daily uh and if so maybe we ought to scale back who we're using these dogs on and use other tools that we have available to us to capture these people yeah. which i'm all for um, and like I say, though, know, just because you can use a dog, that doesn't mean you should, should use the dog on everything. Yeah. Um, you know, so no, that's, that's refreshing for sure. Cause again, <clears throat> it boils down to discretion and as, as much as I love dogs, seeing yeah. dogs do what they're supposed to, to do what they're bred, raised and trained for not unnecessarily, you know, and, and you see that yeah. even in the military, like there's some units that send them on fucking one way trips regularly, you know, and, and I fucking hate that, you know, yeah, or, no. or they're biting people that really shouldn't be getting bit, you know, mm -hmm. cause they're like, I, I, you know, trying to, it's like the traffic cop. It's like trying to rack up as many bites as they can. And, you know, it's like, yeah, if, if they're shit bags and they deserve it, yes, absolutely. But you know, if they're not fucking come on. Yeah. No, Again, for it's just sure. one of those things that just makes you as a, as an institution look fucking bad. But, um, I, I asked you and then interrupted my apologies on that. Were there any other big uh, like high target high, guys? High value. Uh, um, shit I, I can't think of any. I mean, like I said, they're all pretty violent. Um, you know, we've gone after homicide guys. Um, that raping suspect was, uh, you know, I felt pretty value, valued in that yeah. um, after what, what he had done to this, this gal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, man, like they're all fucking violent, you know, yeah. In any other circumstances, uh, in those 20 some odd bites that, uh, f from like a, holy shit, I'm really proud of my dog being able to find and bite him that stick out. Um, well, fuck all of them really. I mean, when your dog goes out and does his job I, I, every single one, you know, to this day, I'm like, I'm proud of the dog. Um, but, um, you know, yeah, uh, there was one incident where I'm, I'm like fairly confident that had, we not had Dax there that either one of us, one of the officers would have got killed or, um, the suspect for sure probably would have got killed. And it was this guy <clears throat> went into a gas station and like took, took the gas station over. Um, and he ended up being a wanted, I think he was a wanted fugitive out of like Seattle or something. Um, took this gas station over <clears throat> go, and barricades ends up barricading himself in the bathroom in this gas station. Long of the short is, um, we end up, he's making threats to us that he's going to kill us and all this crap. Uh, we end up after a, a while breaching the door. And, um, I made the decision because I knew it was obviously going to be a small room that when I bre when we breached the door, I was going to launch the dog in and generally we'll do like a breach and hold, um, and assess like what the hell's going on. But, um, I decided I was going to, I told the guys, I'm like, all right, fucking breach back out. And I'm going to launch the dog. So they breached the door. <clears throat> as soon as the door breaches open, the light was on and I had, I had already sent the dog. It was like simultaneous. And, um, I see the guy and he's got this huge like buck knife. Um, and he's standing there like this and he's like going to come at us. Um, 
And because I had launched Dax, he didn't see the dog. And that dog was so fast that he fucking hit that guy so hard. Like the knife flew out of his hand and he was on his back before. Like it was crazy. Um, and the guy, the officers were like, fuck dude. (laughs) Like, dude if he wasn't there like that yeah. that guy would have come out and yeah. and fucking stabbed one of those guys for sure yeah or you would have shot him you know? or yeah or yeah. we would have shot but i still think he would have been able to stab one of them because yeah. of the proximity <laughs> but that dog was on him so fast and yeah. it, it literally knocked that knife out of his hand god damn that's um, fucking awesome yeah so that that was with dax i mean yeah. you're a good dog but yeah. just fucking too way too much of a liability yeah so I had to did, did he have any uh any accidental bites on mm-hmm. non-officers yeah um (laughs) yeah fuck yeah so one one story that i still get made fun of about um i just got made fun of the other night about it at work uh we do these you know pr events whatever little demos and stuff and uh (laughs) he's not it doesn't really seem like the dog and pony type of well here the thing is is like he's not like the dog was very friendly um but when it was time to work man he fucking turned it on yeah um so when we do like pr events and stuff he's he's friendly dog like it's like he knows um he'd let people pet him and stuff uh obviously we're cautious about it but so we're doing this demo and uh this lady this freaking lady like i'm talking to somebody else this lady kind of sneaks up behind me i have dax uh, on a lead and uh, he's sitting there and this lady goes down to bend down to like get in his face yeah which i fucking tell everybody don't get in the dog's face like that's like dog 101 don't ever do that for any dog she does goes to get in his face he jumps up and bites her right in the face god damn so when i realized that i fucking yank him back and he immediately let go over um but he got her right right below the eye and uh i'm like oh my god and i'm like fucking pissed and so um make sure she's okay she just had a little laceration below her eye and and, um i'm like we have a was she pissed or did she feel like a she was kind of like I think she felt like it was her fault, but yeah, yeah she was kind of startled, obviously. Yeah. Anyways, we end up, um, we have a form that we can fill out if we get an accidental bite on a citizen and they can fill it out. It's a liability waiver. Um, you know, we can give them mon- monetary, some cash or ch- write them a check, whatever, depending on the circumstance. But um, so she signed that. We gave her like 60 bucks and I, <laughs> I, no went, I went across the street Fucking to McDonald's bucks. <laughs> and I bought her a, a Big Mac. At McDonald's, she wanted lunch. I yeah. bought her a fucking Big Mac, and she was stoked. God, what a fucking trip! Sixty bucks on a Big Mac. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's set true. up a booth like Live Bites for sixty bucks on a Big yeah. Mac. Yeah, so how that was a uh, fuck. Anyways, yeah. God damn, that's a fucking trip. Um, all right, so you end up washing him out, and then mm-hmm. you get uh, Axel, who you still have. Yeah. So you did uh, what four years with him? Yeah. Um, what was what was the the transition from Dax to Axel like? Was it night and day? Just like- Dude, night and day. As soon as we switched over to, to Greg in his training program, night night and day. Yeah. I mean, fuck. I, I, it got to a point with Dax where I was like, I loved being a handler, but I wasn't really having fun anymore on these deployments because I was so worried about the dog biting another officer, yeah. me, a citizen. Like, So when I got Axel, Greg uh, selected Axel. Uh, I loved it. It was like rejuvenated me. Um, a lot of fun. What, uh, where, where was he at? Some similar, uh, age range. Was he two or. Yeah. So Axel was when I got him, he's actually like three, I think. Um, he came imported him from the Netherlands and prior to me getting him, he actually was, a I want to say like an IPO three dog. And so he was traveling around Europe. Uh, he was in Scotland doing trials. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, doing that for like the first two, three years of his life. Yeah. And he was a champion doing that wow which was kind of cool yeah. um <clears throat> but still a real dog obviously yeah 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 so then we got him after that yeah what uh when you first got him was there because you already had experience and and you know pretty edgy experience with uh with dax mm-hmm. um was there any feeling out process that uh that surprised you or uh that was difficult or was it just like fucking smooth say on this dog is push button super easy yeah, I mean, because he was doing all that prior, um, it, it was pretty pretty easy. Yeah. Um, he was doing like garden bark at first when I got him, um, which I, I fucking hate. Yeah. I, I don't like that. I think it's dangerous. Yeah, super dangerous. I didn't like it. Like the day I got Axel, I brought him home. He put me in a garden bark in my kitchen. 
like he was sitting in front of me barking yeah. at me and i'm like yeah. i knew that if i moved or did something funny he was gonna bite me yeah anyway so um we were able to break that from him <clears throat> And I was really concerned, like the first time I deployed him in, in real life, that he was going to put a bad guy in a garden bark. Yeah. Um, he never did. He, uh, oh, shit. I've never had that issue with him. How, uh, how many bites did you get with him? Shoot, 20, uh, close to 30. No oh, shit. Yeah. Was he as uh, damaging as, as Dax? Nah. No, nah, he was more of a bite, hang on, shepherd, you yeah. know. Um, but, Still got the job done. But. Oh, yeah, for sure. And, like, it, you know, he... Um, we, we broke one guy's arm. Um, I mean, those bite, the pressure on those bites yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. Was um, he a, b- a bigger dog then? I'm assuming also. No, he's really? actually not. He's, um, smaller. He's probably 70 pounds but, and he's like, he's got the drive of a Mal. <clears throat> he's super wiry like a Mal. Yeah. But like the brain of a shepherd. Huh? That's a, that's so a good mix. So it was mix. kind of b- good, both best of both worlds. Really? Yeah. yeah. I, I've brought in a, a handful of German shepherds in the last few years that, uh, Jesus Christ, they they were just neurotic. Like you know, to right. the, the ones that I found that had all of the tools to do the work that I needed them to do um, made them just a real pain in the ass. Frankly, like I just haven't come across very many good German shepherds in in a while. But yeah, um, they're different. But uh, at any rate, um, all right. So firing on all cylinders with him. Mm-hmm. Um, where where did the instances happen where you you were using him and uh, mixing it up shooting with people? So I got in two shootings with Dax. Um, both of those shootings, the dog was in the car, um, so I didn't use I didn't deploy the dog on those. But um, can you uh, tell us those two stories? Yeah. So the first shooting I was in, uh, it was a domestic violence call. Um, it kind of started out as I was actually en route to go do an attempt pickup on somebody. Um, what is that? Yeah, that's where somebody's wanted and we're going <clears> to <throat> go with a group of, of officers and go pick this person up. Yeah. And we always bring the dog in case we get, you know, someone squirts out the back or yeah. we have to find them. But um, so I was attached to do that uh, when this call comes out. Um, uh, and, and we're lucky enough in our department where if you're in the canine unit, we're not, you know, we don't we're citywide we um we're a supplement we're not a task with like beads and cold paper call like it's not what we do yeah so all you do is canine canine stuff all, all canine stuff and yeah. then um yeah we'll supplement you know patrol guys if they need us so um so i was in route to do that uh, a domestic violence call comes out which we get so many of like I, I didn't even i wasn't even paying attention to it at first but I could hear it progressively getting worse. Um, the dispatcher was putting out like, now he's got a gun. Um, you know, there were three kids in the house, the young kids. Um, and when they said that, I was kind of like, I, I think I should go to that. I just had this weird, like, I wanted to go to that call. So I told the folks I was with, I was like, Hey, I, I got to break off this. I got to go to the, this other call. So I respond out there just before I'm getting there. Two officers got there first. Um, they heard a gunshot. It was an apartment complex. They hear a gunshot, but they don't know where it's coming from. Um, now one of the little kids had called 911 and said that daddy had a gun and was trying to kill mom. God um, damn. yeah, it's fucked up. So <clears throat> I now get there. I'm third one on scene. I have no clue where one of the other officers is. Uh, she's a female. Um, she branched off another way i meet up with the other officer i'm like hey where's where's so and so and he's like fuck i don't know where where she's at and i'm like where's the apartment and he's like i don't know um we were trying to find it and it was like six o'clock at night there's like fucking people everywhere out in this parking lot you know and then we hear another gunshot and it was like relatively close to us well i thought it was a little further down than what what it was and i'm standing next to him And the kids come running down the stairs. They're fucking freaked out. Um, you know, we grabbed them and literally just sh- threw them in some random apartment. Um, didn't even care whose apartment it was. We opened the door. We put them in there. Um, I told my partner, I'm like, hey, I think it's right here around the corner. So we round the corner. Are you fucking drawn down? Yeah, just- I've got my gun out for sure. Um, so does he. And as I come around the corner, I'm like in the open now. And the guy comes down this stairwell, probably, I don't know, 15 feet in front of me. And, uh, fuck, he comes down the stairs. He's, I'll never, like, I'll never forget this. He had this, like, all, just all white shirt on, 
and he had the gun in his hand and I'm like, fuck, there he is. And he's like looking around, he's looking for us and he sees me and my partner and I don't know who shot first, but he and I start shooting at each other. Um, he's elevated cause he's on, he's on a stairwell. So I'm assuming his rounds went over my head. Uh, so I shoot back. Um, I don't know where my partner is now at this point. Um, so he ends up retreating back and taking cover. I go take cover behind the corner of the building. And like now all this shit's going through my head because like, this is like the first gunfight I've ever been in. Mm -hmm. And at first I'm like, fuck, this guy's going to just ag aggress me and like, just shoot me. Right. So I pie around the corner again and there he is. We shoot at each other again, engage with each other. And I swear I was hitting him because, um, I could see like movement in his body as if, as if like he's being shot, but like he's not going down. Like, so, so the first time you didn't hit him, second time you didn't I, hit him. I don't know. I have no fucking clue. I mean, I thought I was. Yeah. Um, it looked like I was, but it's not like what you see in the movies where you shoot someone and they fly fucking yeah. backwards and die. You know, that definitely wasn't happening. So uh, we engage each other um, for the second time. He goes back up the stairwell. Um, I go back around, take cover. Now a couple other guys are showing up. I'm like, fucking don't go around the corner. He's right there, you know? And so I actually ran around the back of this, uh, particular building because I wasn't sure if he was able to get out like a back slider and flank us. So I run around to the back and I realize that there, he can't, there's no way he can get out the back. So then, um, my buddy Nate shows up, he's got his rifle and I told Nate, I'm like, fucking he, dude he's like right around the corner um you know and we've engaged each other a couple of times so nate um posts up there i run back to my car and uh, i had a ride along with me i had some chick <laughs> yeah who wanted to be a cop and they asked me to take her on a ride along so i was like yeah sure yeah so she was in the car like fucking freaking out um it's pro probably not a good job for her no though. she yeah. decided after that she did not want to be a cop yeah anyways um I tell her, I'm like, get down. And so she gets down and, and I grab my rifle out of my car because I was like, fuck this handgun. Um, grab my rifle. Uh, my sergeant shows up. <clears throat> There's been some more gunfight going on. And I told my sergeant there was a um, like a row of cars and a dumpster enclosure that had a pretty good, if I could get to that dumpster enclosure, I could get a good shot up into that stairwell and get them mm -hmm. you know so i told my sergeant i was like hey i need to get to that dumpster enclosure and i'm, and I'm gonna fucking pick them off and he's like okay if you can get there so i told my buddy nate i'm like hey you fucking cover me i'm gonna i'm gonna get to that dumpster enclosure so nate fucking steps out with his rifle um fucking in the open and uh he covers me and i was able to make it across this parking lot and i started uh <clears throat> bless you thanks I just started bounding from car to car and the guy kept coming out shooting. What was he shooting? Do you remember? Yeah. He had a Kimber 45. Did um, he have like five fucking mags or what? Yeah. He kept re like, he'd reload his, uh, his handgun. You can hear him reloading it. <laughs> um, so that's what he, he would go up in the stairwell at, back in his apartment. He'd re he had a shit ton of ammo in his house. Um, a bunch of preloaded mags. So I go bounding cars. Um, I'm almost to the dumpster enclosure. And then now he has found the other officer that I didn't even know she was over. So she was behind a car uh, in the parking lot. He sees her and now he's shooting at her. Um, you know, and she's like yelling on the radio. How, how far of a distance is that? Um, from him to her? Yeah. She was uh, decently distance away. I don't know. She probably was like 20 yards, um, 20, 30 yards away from him yeah. behind a car. So he's shooting the car. She's like yelling on the radio. I, honestly, I thought she was, I thought she got shot. I, yeah. I thought she was fucking dying. Um, and so at that point I'm like, okay, I'm not, I'm not making it to the dumpster enclosure. Like this is fucking it. So I get down on my stomach. I belly crawled up to the, this wheel well, the tire of a forerunner that was parked there. And I sucked up against that. And I'm like, he doesn't know I'm there. There's no fucking way he saw me. So I'm in a prone and, uh, I'm like, he went back upstairs again and I, I was like, okay, when he fucking comes out, like I, I got him and uh, man, he comes back down the stairs. I think he got like two, two more rounds off and 
myself and Nate, um, fucking shot him, shot him and killed him. Um, he, he ends up fa- fucking falling down the stairs and, uh, yeah, he was fucking dead. Do you know, uh, did any of your pistol rounds hit him? Yeah. So they did, I think four, four or five rounds, I think hit pistol rounds hit him. And then, um, I shot, I think 10 rounds with my AR and Nate shot about nine or 10 with his. Um, and I think damn near all of our rounds hit him. Yeah. W- one round hit him in the elbow and it severed his arm. I mean, his arm was like blown off his, his body. Yeah. Are you guys using green tip or ball or what? <clears throat> no, at the time, I th- in fact, I think we still use the same rounds. No, it's just a soft tip, um, two, two, three rounds so that it can't penetrate. You it's know, it's not frangible, is it? Or is it? No, it is. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. Um, that was going to be my next question is that, uh, your pistol rounds aren't right. They're just, no, yeah. yeah. Uh, w- were there any other casualties or, or whatever with that amount of rounds going back and forth in that apartment complex? <laughs> no, I have pictures of all this and in, in video uh, I can show you after this, but, um, there were uh, apartments that were definitely shot up. Yeah. A lot of rounds went through some apartments, like by the grace of God, nobody, yeah. nobody got shot. I think everybody was like just taking cover. I was going to say, so when you first showed up, there's people everywhere. As yeah. soon as the shots were <clears throat> fucking scurrying, like, yeah, people were running. The stupid thing is, is like people were running out of their apartments. Like what's going on? And I'm like, get the fuck back, you know? And there's yeah. kids out there. Um, yeah. it, it was fucked. And, and like, like I, this shooting like specifically sticks with me because number one, the kids were involved. It was a domestic thing. Like, you know, I told you like my childhood, um, yeah. it like brought me back to that. And I, I can only imagine like what these kids were feeling like, because when we ended up, um, so we had to go rescue the wife who was upstairs. She, it was reported that she had shot her in the head. Um, she was a mess. It looked like he shot her in the head. Uh, he actually like was pissed, almost pistol whipped her to death. So we quickly got her out of there and got her to the medics. Um, but we had to get those kids out and you know they were like is my daddy dead god damn man yeah it was fucked up that, that's a, a like a, it's hard to imagine a, a shittier fucking scenario you know it's like you got to do what you have to do but like you just killed these kids dad you yep. know like that fuck, know. man that's tough yeah um the the aftermath of, of that like when when something like that happens what what is that process like for for you and nate as the guys <clears throat> that shot and killed him like is it okay now you you, like fucking clear and safe your weapons and now it's an investigation and you go home or go back to the station like is is it like fucking time out Mm -hmm. yeah my sergeant that was there he uh he he fired his handgun too at the end there um so all of us were off yeah it's like uh and that was my first time so um yeah you you basically get like sequestered like you, you get paired up with another officer you get taken back to the station um you're not allowed to talk to anybody you can't obviously you can't talk about what happened yeah right because it's a homicide it's yeah. considered a homicide <clears throat> um you get it you get an attorney um our poa um our association gets gets us a, an attorney they come down there you sit one-on-one with the attorney and you tell them what happened you go over it with them um basically you do a scene walkthrough you, with your attorney you go out to the scene obviously the, like detectives and fucking everybody's out there <clears throat> you do a scene walkthrough you kind of tell your attorney like hey this is where i was standing when i fired my rounds whatever um and then you do like a two-day sleep cycle um because you can't it's crazy like people think like you'd be able to remember everything you don't like you your mind blacks shit out after yeah. something like that happens um there's no you just don't, you can't remember all the facts and that kind of stuff so you get like a two-day sleep cycle come back a couple days later with your attorney do your interview with the detectives which is like a couple hours long and was, was there any uh feeling of like being interrogated or they even keep well, really hard on you or what no they were good i mean our detectives are really good um you know this is not their first rodeo yeah and so like yeah they, did i feel like i was treated like a fucking criminal no but like I am being investigated for a homicide, yeah. you know, whether it's justified or not, like I have to explain my actions. Yeah. And when you're sitting in an interview room with two detectives in front of you, I mean, yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah. Some wild shit. Um, do you know any of the circumstances no. of, of that guy and his family <laughs> after the fact? Like, yeah, I found out, um, no arrest. He's been arrested once, which is, this is the crazy thing. Like I don't, 
I don't know if he was having a bad day and just snapped. He was drunk. You know, he had alcohol in his, in his system, but um, he had been arrested for DUI like a few years earlier, but nothing, nothing to that extent, yeah. which is pretty rare to be yeah. honest. Like usually when that shit happens, it's like these people are violent. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he didn't have an arrest history, you know, Do you know anything else about him, like where he worked or any of that kind of shit. <clears throat> Uh, I have no idea where he worked. Um, I try not to dabble too much into that stuff after you don't want to get to know. I just, I just don't. Yeah. Like it's not, I don't know. I felt like I said, it kind of sticks with me because of the kids and the whole dynamic of it. No, yeah. I'd probably be the same way, but since I wasn't there, I'm just curious, you know, like, especially with that lack of criminal history, Yeah, like what I'm just, just wanting to know about the guy just purely out of, out of curiosity. But, um, so Jax, uh, I'm sorry, Jax, Dax. A- Axel. Oh, right? Axel, yeah. Uh, he was in the car when that happened? Dax, Dax was in the car for that. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I remember when I got there, I was like, I was going to get the dog out because I'm like, you know, something you would probably have the dog out. But then for, for whatever reason, I'm like, ah, fuck, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave him in the car on this one because I don't know. I just had a weird feeling about it. And I feel like if I would have had the dog out, I don't, I mean, I'm pretty sure the dog maybe would have been killed um, because, uh, I, I mean, I, I can't say I would have deployed the dog on the guy, but like, fuck, if a guy is shooting at me and I have something there to distract that or, you yeah. know, that is a suicide mission for sure. But like, yeah, it's, a tough it's me or the fucking dog, you know? Yeah. Well, and, and to me, that's another thing that, um, you know, for anybody listening that, that isn't a, a cop or has never served in the military or whatever, that when, when you typically when you see people on a national level in the media or what have you, that are super critical of, of police or military when, when they're faced with situations like that. I think it is crucial to realize that like that, that is where those things happen is Mm -hmm. there's kids, there's other people, there's other officers. Like you have a ride along chick, you've got a dog, you don't know whether or not you should use because like maybe Mm -hmm. you should like there's a a million fucking things going through your mind and, and you don't, have the luxury of any time to think about it. Like mm-hmm. you just have to respond. Yeah. You and know, that's and, the hard part about it. Yeah. And, 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 it, and sometimes, um, you know, that response, uh, you know, it is not the right one. Uh, mm-hmm. I think in a, in a lot of cases, it's just the lesser of fucking five evils. Yeah. You know, like yeah. there, there isn't a good, good decision or, yeah. or, you know, one that you feel good about, but, but you do the best you can with what you have at the time. And, and that's, that's fucking tough. And, and I do think, uh, you know, so many cops get such a fucking bad, uh, bad rap unwarranted by people that just don't understand, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. Anyway, I'll tell you what, man, I, I tell all handlers, I'm like, dude, there is so, there's so much that goes into this job. Like that type of scenario, like, do yeah. I bring the dog? Don't I bring the dog? If I do bring the dog, fuck, do what do, do I do with them now? Yeah. You know, because that, that fucking dog is going to be going crazy when those gunshots yeah. are gone. I mean, anyways, it's just a lot to think about, but I'm pretty uh, glad in the decision I made, I left him in the car. Yeah. I mean, that's like, yeah. Couldn't have asked for a better yeah. outcome for that. Yeah. That's a, that's a wild fucking story. What, uh, so what yeah. was the second one? Was that with Dax also? Yeah. Or? The second one was with Dax. I didn't, um, so there was two handlers on this call, myself and Chris, uh, Chris Boston was a handler for us. Um, he's retired, but he, uh, so this one's actually a little bit, a little bit more crazy. Um, yeah, we get a call, uh, of this guy that goes to his ex-wife's house and, and, um, t- tries torching the house with her and her kids in it. So he like dumps gas on it and lights it on fire. <clears throat> um, so we're on the lookout for this guy. We know where he lives. Uh, me and Chris go kind of by the house to see if he's there. The helicopter's up. They fly over the house. They're like, yeah, his truck's not there. So now me and Chris are kind of like putting ourselves in, in a position like to try to find him if he's going to drive back to the house. He doesn't. Um, we're like, okay, I guess he's not going home after he just did that. You know? So anyways, probably like 30 minutes go by and, uh, the, su- the, the suspect, the criminal guy, he lived with his twin brother. And so like, th- like 30 minutes after we had cleared this thing, uh, the brother calls us and he's like, Hey, my, uh, my brother just got home. He's got a pistol in his waistband. He's got some explosives. And he said he just burned his wife's house down and he smells like gas and told me to get out of the house so I don't die. And we're like, fuck. Like, so he did go home. He did go home yeah. and he fucking was ready. And, um, so we get sent, obviously we get dispatched there <clears throat> And now I'm like, 
fuck, he said he had explode, like he had these homemade explosives and shit. And I'm like, what the fuck? Like, I've never, how the hell, how, how do we, I was just trying to rack in my head, like, how are we going to respond to this, you know? Um, so. I mean, wouldn't that typically be a SWAT scenario? <clears throat> yes, except for he um, had called 911 and was threatening to blow up his, uh, his, his house and start shooting people. And so like it really escalated really quickly and it forced our hand because the helicopter shows up overhead and he's, he's, uh, um, you know, watching him on his camera and he's like, Hey, the guy is out front. He does have like these devices in his driveway. He's pouring gas on him. Um, and he's got a gun in his hand. And the other shitty thing is there was like a bunch of kids out there riding their bikes cause it was summertime. And I think it was probably only like nine or 10 at night. Um, and they're like, Hey, you guys need to get over here and like do something. Cause I don't think he's playing around. What, what is the, uh, time constraint SWAT wise, or is that not something you want to mention? Um, I mean, uh, deployment wise, you know, generally probably like an hour from the time you get a call out, um, get all the guys there geared up. Um, you know, it, it's, it's probably about an hour yeah, at minimum. So in a, in a situation like that, it's just a time thing. It's a time, time thing to wait for him. Yeah. Like, so, and here's how this played out. So like we showed up, me, Chris, and this other officer, a couple other officers, and, um, we're down the street and this street is pitch black. There's no street lights on this street. And I don't know exactly where the house is. The helicopter is giving us updates about where he's at. And I'm like, dude, I'm like, you need to kind of guide us in. Um, anyway, so that was, uh, an issue in and of itself, but so Chris is there and I'm there, we're both handlers. And I'm like, I just had the last, last dog bite. And so we, you know, it's his turn. So I'm like, Hey, Chris, get your dog out. So Chris gets his dog out. I get my rifle and this other officer, Dan, he gets his rifle. And now it's like, now the guy calls 911 again. And he's like, Hey, you guys got 12 fucking seconds to get here. And I'm, I'm fucking killing people. So, um, I, I, I was feeling like we were feeling like fucking pressured. Like he was, like, like he, he was dictating this, huh? Like he, he was saying, get here. Or I'm going to start. Yeah. Playing. Like I felt like he was dictating how this, the time, the timeline on this. And so, um, it was just fucked. And so these kids are on their bikes. We're like, get the hell out of here. We, um, I still don't know exactly where the house is, but like Chris goes on one side of the street and he's moving up with his dog with a couple other guys. And I'm on the other side of the street with this, with Dan and uh, we start kind of making our way up using these houses and cars as cover. So he didn't see us or hear us. And finally, I see the glow of a cell phone, like five houses up. And I'm like, fucking there he is, dude. He's in the driveway. So we sneak up one house shy of him, his neighbor's house. And he has no idea we're there. And he's on the phone with 911. The are, dispatcher. are any of you guys on night vision? No, we don't have that shit. Really? No. No. Um, no, we're using fucking our eyeballs in the middle of the fucking <laughs> dark, dude. It was like, yeah. Anyway, so I can now see him. We're we're hugged up against this garage, and he's on the phone with dispatch saying like, "Hey, he's like counting down basically, right?" And um, I can smell this like overwhelming odor of gas, and it was making me feel pr fucking uncomfortable. Like the whole thing was fucking not not comfortable. Um, I could see he's got a gun in his hand. It's a pistol. And, and, uh, I, I told Dan, I was like, okay, dude, I'm going to fucking hit him with my tack light on my rifle. And he gets like a nanosecond to drop the gun. And, and I'm like, you cool with that? And he's like, yeah, we game planned it. Uh, I hit him with the light. He immediately spins towards us with the gun and, uh, fuck, we just, this start, it was on. I yeah. mean, all the shooting started happening. Um, Dan was like, so close to he was his shoulder he and i were so close to each other like his rifle was right by my face and he's just you know shooting and i could feel the percussion of his rifle um and he had like a tricked out rifle it was super loud um his brass was like hitting me at one point his brass hit me in the back of my head and i think as it had burned me and i was feeling the percussion i thought i got shot in the head and i fell down to the ground um and I like, I like feeling myself and I'm, I realized like I wasn't hit and I fucking popped back up. Now the guy's like going in and out of the garage, the air units, like updating us, like his, his movements. Cause he was hard to see. Are they using fucking FLIR? Or yeah. FLIR. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They got, they had him on FLIR and yeah. I've got, I've got this on video too. You can see, but 
he goes in the garage. Can we show any of that in, into the YouTube episode or is that fucking, I don't know. I guess we'll, we can talk about it. So you may, you may get some good shit. Um, yeah. So, so I actually see him go in the garage and he sucks himself up against the wall and, but he's got his arm hanging out with the gun. And so I start shooting where I know that he's at in the garage through the wall. And I actually end up shooting him in the arm. It ends up shooting the gun out of his hand. The gun like spins up, lands on the ground. Um, he goes and fucking picks it up and his arm is fucked up. And he like tucks it under his, his arm and grabs it with his left hand. And now, um, now he's in the garage and he's on his hands and knees and he's trying to like ignite these explosives and the area and it's like, Hey, you guys got to fucking do something. Cause he's trying to knock these things off. And so, um, I, I'm fucking talking to Dan and we had like, we, we were in a bad spot where we were, we were basically shooting past the, the house and we needed to get a better shot into the garage. And so there was a big tree that separated like his yard and his, his neighbor's yard, but it was like really close to him. And I'm, I told Dan, I was like, we need to get to that tree to, to shoot him. And I'm like, are you, are you cool with if, if we both bound up to that? And he's like, yep. And I'm like, all right, let's fucking go. We're going to sprint to this tree. And, and that's what we did. We fucking shot a few rounds, bolted to this tree. And we were both just hugged up behind this tree. And then we start, I see him on the ground. He's literally got a, he's trying to light these things. And so I, we start shooting at him. He stands up and just runs right at us with the gun and, we dropped him right there in the driveway where he had, um, he had one of those explosives in the driveway. He lands right next to it and the gun falls out of his hand and he's like still kind of moving around towards the, the gun and this explosive thing. And I, and I just kept in my head thinking like, fuck, we're going to blow up. <clears throat> That's all I could think about. And, uh, I had an aim point red dot side on my rifle and I put it, p- put the dot on his head and did two two follow up shots to his head and ki- killed him instantly. Yeah. Do, do you have any idea what the explosives were after the fact of what he was trying? Yeah. To, yeah. So it? he had these um these high pressurized acetylene tanks, um, and he fucking tweaked with them, uh, and then he like cut the gas lines and shit in his house in, in his garage, and dumped gas like on everything. I think so. EOD. So after this is all done, um, like. So Chris is now with us and to back up what he did, this is a funny story. He's crazy. Like Chris is like this fucking crazy guy, like super good cop, good friend of mine. Like he and I have been in a lot of shit together. Um, <clears throat> he's retired now, but uh, good dude. So he's across the street and he's like, he can't see shit. He's hearing all this gunfire going on. And um, he's with these two other officers and and I won't mention them, but his dog is going off. Right. And so like, they're like, shut your fucking dog up. (laughs) And he's like, I can't shut my fucking dog up. So they're yelling at him. And in the middle of this like gunfight, he, he looks at him and he's like, you're killing my fucking vibe and darts across the street and takes cover behind a van right where Dan and I were in this gunfight. And so afterwards he's like, he's telling me this. He's like, dude, you wouldn't believe this. They're yelling at me. And he's like, I told him they were killing my vibe and I fucking took off running. I'm like, no, you didn't. And sure enough, I asked one of the other guys, I was like, I was like, did Chris really do that? And he's like, he's like, yeah, dude. He's like, that guy fucking said we were killing his vibe and he just took off running. I'm like, fucking, fucking Chris. Cops fighting with each other while, oh, while dude. gun battles going on. Yeah. That's so fucking, fucking yeah. Well, Christopher. Yeah. Um, so that's funny. So we were going to use his dog to go dead check the guy. And, um, He's like, nah, like he was dead. I was like, Hey, I, I fucking shot him in the head twice. Like he's, he's dead. Um, and so we decided not to, because number one, we didn't want to send the dog up there and have the dog fuck with that explosive or something. And just, it was too risky. So Chris decides that we need to back off. We end up backing off the house, evacuated all the neighbors, um, corned off the area. EOD came out and rendered those rendered those saves. But even those guys were like, man, you guys got lucky. Cause if he would have got those to, to go off, like, fuck you, were, it would have killed you Yeah, for sure. Wow. <clears throat> so fucking gnarly. Um, so after that same, same process, right? The, yeah. Same process. Yeah. Got um, taken back. And then, so you, you still had Dax at that point. I had Dax. Yeah. He was in the car again. <laughs> 
<laughs> feeling left out. Yeah. So after that, um, what what kind of happened, uh, you know, call wise, I guess, from from then until kind of the next uh, big big things that have happened to you. Um, I think it was probably shortly after that I got rid of Dax. Maybe he had fucking PTSD from all. I don't know, yeah. but um, got rid of him. Um, I mean, I I've just been involved in uh, you know, just a lot of uh, being a dog handler. Like you're you are like the tip of the spear on mm. everything that bad happens, right? So. And not only just for us, but like we help out every agency within our region. Yeah. Uh, we work pretty closely with everybody. So, you know, there were, um, there was an incidence where uh, fucking a deputy um, got shot and killed. And we were at canine training, literally just not far from where it happened. <clears throat> and so that call comes out. Uh, uh, there had been like four officers shot. Jesus. Um, the fuck yeah. happened? They, uh, we, we have a task force that, that goes after stolen cars and stuff. And, um, we have a guy on that team. Uh, they found a stolen car at a hotel, followed it away, picked, picked it off. <clears throat> and we're going to go do a rollback, uh, search at the hotel room where the, the suspect came from. And unbeknownst to them, um, there was a dude in that room who's a fucking violent guy and has shot at cops before, um, they didn't know he was in there. And when they went to go in the hotel room, he just fucking opened fire on them with a rifle, <clears throat> shot two of them. Uh, they, they survived, but they got shot, shot up. Um, and then he goes out on the back balcony to jump off the balcony to, to, to get in another stolen car and take off. There was a perimeter guy down there and, uh, they, they exchanged gun gunshots with each other and just fucking one of his rounds went through the, his car, his patrol car, and like shrapnel went through his shoulder and just fucking hit like when I was told it just hit his um like every everything in his heart like it missed his bones everything and it hit the vital shit in his heart um so when we and he takes off in a car a car chase happens some other cops get out and just annihilate him at a stoplight just jumped out and um yeah fucking just killed him yeah with their rifles so when we show up. I mean, it looked like it was fucking pretty chaotic because the hotel was still in play. They thought there were more shooters in the hotel. I mean, every cop you can think of showed up. We surround this place. There's, I mean, the scene, like there were the cops that were shot, fucking uniform. Like the, the guy that got killed, like got in the ambulance, like nobody suspected he was going to die. Nobody. Wow. Um, and it wasn't until um, like an hour, maybe not even an hour goes by. And we started getting word that he was dead. And we're like, no way. And, and they're like, yeah, he's fucking died. God damn. So, um, did they catch the original guy in the car that, that took off before? Yeah. 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 Yep. They got him <clears throat> and they killed the guy that yeah. shot the, this, uh, the cop. So, um, we had this whole hotel to deal with. And so like all these SWAT teams came out, we got attached to them and, um, we were the only ones allowed in the hotel. And so, um, each SWAT team took a floor and we got linked up with those guys and we fucking breached all these doors. Had, we searched the entire, entire hotel, um, took hours. Um, and ultimately the guy that died was the only, the only bad guy involved in the whole thing. But like, so, I mean, um, just going to stuff like that, um, that was, that was pretty tough. Um, I remember a cap, this captain shows up from, um, I don't know who the hell he was, but he was with the sheriff's department. He shows up and we're all kind of like rallied around and we had knew known that he had died. The officer died. <clears throat> so obviously people are upset and this captain shows up and he's like, fuck man. He was like a breath of fresh air. He's just like, Hey, everyone needs to fucking pick their heads up. He's like, I understand that Bob's dead. Um, and we are going to grieve, but we have a fucking job to do and it's not done yet. So pick your heads up we we're going to do this and then we'll deal with that later. And, uh, it like totally changed the mood of everybody. That's awesome. Um, like little simple words like that. Just, yeah, that's good. I leadership. think it fired everybody up, you know? Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's uh, the essence of leadership. I think. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so we did that. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. I mean, just going to calls like that, um, you know, w you know, shooting shootings are happening. You're going out searching for these bad guys and the shooters and stuff. And like always in the back of my mind, you know, I'm always just like, 
I don't know. I'm always expecting something bad to happen. Yeah. Um, so th that brings up an interesting thought for me is that that <clears throat> we were talking a little earlier about, you know, uh, discretion based on experience. Mm -hmm. th there's another element, I think, that uh, and this is where um, I think most people fail to understand the the real difficulty of uh, of how to navigate that environment and still keep a a level head yeah you have to is mm -hmm. that you know just like with any anything is if you do something and, and interact or, or encounter rather the same shit over and over it, it changes how you deal with it you know it, mm -hmm. it changes how you approach it it changes how you it changes how you respond to it and so you know when you're dealing with people that fucking hate you that are mm -hmm. trying to kill you you know that um you know, at a minimum fucking can't stand you, you know, but in a lot of cases, like people are actively trying to take your life, which, you know, I know I've been in those positions before and, and it changes how, how you view those people and, and how yeah. you interact with them. And mm -hmm. so it makes it even more difficult uh, to make split decision, split decision seconds that aren't influenced by 10 years of over and over and over of dealing with those same things You're like it, it's it's impossible from a human <clears throat> nature standpoint I, I would i would uh, beg to argue that it's it's impossible to to be completely fucking neutral and, yeah. and not pull your gun and do something quicker than maybe you would have had you not been through that 300 fucking times well that's why i said earlier the guy that pulled the gun out you know yeah. when i was new like i didn't shoot him right but like now yeah i have no doubt that it would be a different outcome but yeah you're right it does and emotions play into that like I'm a super easygoing guy. I'm a, I'm actually a very giving person. Um, I'm, I'm level headed, but when I get into, um, a situation like that, where like I need to be violent, like I will be fucking violent. Yeah. Um, and I will, and I will bring the violence to you if you're trying to kill me or mm -hmm. one of my partners or somebody else, you know? So, yeah. um, you have to have that mindset because if you don't, then it's going to, I mean, fuck man it's you or the other person, yeah. you know, the best man's going to win Yeah. period. Yeah. And I think the, the biggest thing to remember, um, for us non cops is that, you know, we'll take me, like, let's say you and I have never met and I, I'm in that area and you pull me over for something, not that you're a traffic cop, but whatever you get my point is that, you know, you have no fucking idea who I am, mm -hmm. you know, who I am yeah. or who I'm not. Uh, you know, so, um, I, th I think that that's where a lot of these scenarios that end up making it, uh, on the news is that, you know, whoever is in the position to, to chill the fuck out, mm -hmm. you know, and not resist arrest or get attitude or, yeah. or whatever, doesn't ever take that into, into account. It's fuck you. Yeah. Like wh how, how dare you pull me over, you know, you know, type of thing. And, and, uh, it's just, you know, to me, it's just so unfortunate that, that there's such uh, vitriol that way. And it, it, uh, it, it fucking sucks for you guys. My, my hat's off. I, I couldn't do it for a number of reasons. I mean, to me, I, I just don't, like I was saying, or the biggest thing on a principle level, there's too many things that I disagree with that, that are illegal, uh, for me to, to, to be a cop and, and, uh, you know, not <laughs> fucking ignore 90% of the shit that I saw. Yeah. Um, you know, which probably isn't the right attitude for that position, but on the same token, you know, there's guys there too that, you know, got beat up in high school one too many times or yeah, have a little sure. dick or, you know, whatever it is yeah. like, like that just can't, can't be in that position of, of authority and, and not fucking take advantage of it. That really fucks the rest of you guys mm -hmm. over. It's just sad, but yeah, no doubt. Um, in terms of any, any good stories with Axel that, uh, that you can share. <clears throat> yeah. This last shooting I was in was, um, Axel was involved in this one. Um, yeah, so that, uh, this was just in 2019, so fairly recent. Um, uh, Axel and I and were at, on a call with another another handler, uh, Nate, who was in that first shooting with me. He became a dog handler. Um, he's, he's still a handler. <clears throat> um, we were both on a call. It was a, an alarm call. A couple guys get there. Some guy was b breaking into a building. When they showed up, he ran back inside. Okay, so whatever. So we show up. <clears throat> Again, it was Nate's turn to deploy his dog. Um, I told Nate, I was like, hey, go ahead and take this. Take a team in with you, and I'll, I'll be on the outside in case he fucking squirts out of the back. And I was back there with Axel. So um, Nate takes a team of guys in. They started searching this this building, looking for this for this guy. And uh, 
What was the building? Do you remember? Yeah, it was like a like a commercial business or yeah. something. Like he had fucking broken into, you know. Um, it was a burglary. So uh, while I'm standing back there, I'm chatting with this uh, this newer officer, Joe. He's uh, he was like brand new. I think he had just he had just got off training like literally a week before this. And so I'm sitting there chatting with Joe. I'm like, hey, dude, talking to him about like covering a handler and shit, you know. Um, and so then a call comes out. The dispatcher's just like, yeah, hey. Uh, like kind of nonchalant and it was um there's a possible shots fired call at the mall the mall was literally across the street from where we were at and so possibly a guy shot a gun off in the mall parking lot they weren't sure um and so then uh i kind of just didn't think twice about it but then the more i started thinking about it i'm like man we need to go to that because you know there's fucking all these active shooting things that have been happening across the, the country lately it was like I just didn't feel comfortable with just not going to that. So I, I told Joe, I was like, let's go, dude, let's go head over to that. <clears throat> I asked Nate, I was like, Hey man, are you cool inside? And he's like, yeah, we're going to continue the search. And so, um, I took Joe and we started driving over there and I'm like reading the text of the call. And, and in the call, it said like, it may have been a gun, but it could have been a cell phone and he put it in his pocket. So it like, wasn't even definitive that this guy had a gun. Yeah. And so, um, but so fuck I'm in front of Joe and I, as I'm pulling in the mall parking lot, I see the description of the guy involved in this thing and he's running like right towards JC Penney's the store. And he's probably a hundred yards in front of me, prob- probably a little further than that, but it's just a wide open parking lot. So I, th- I see him running into the, towards the mall. And I, and at first I'm like, fuck, I don't want him to get in the mall. I don't want to chase this guy in the mall, you know? So I throw my lights on and my siren to distract him. And he, he, it worked and he sees me and he turns around and he's running the opposite way. And then, um, now dispatch is like, Hey, another person called and said they, they think they saw that he had a firearm in his hand, whatever. So, um, I'm like, okay, I'm kind of like up in it a little bit. I'm like checking the boxes. Like, am I going to deploy my dog on this guy? Um, when I catch up to him. So I start going down like my checklist of whether or not, whether I'm going to deploy the dog or not. And, um, he's like running through this parking lot. There's like these business, there's these restaurants out there. There's like a red Robin and uh, burger King and some other stuff. And it was six o'clock at night on a summer, summer night. So there was a lot of people out there. So he runs out onto this main roadway. I drive my car out on the road. Um, and I, I see him running down the sidewalk. So I fly, I go past him, park my car. I kind of cut him off with my car and I jump out and I, um, I, I have, I don't ever just jump out and grab my dog. Like I always jump out gunfight first and then transition to the dog. Right. So I jump out, point my gun at him. I'm like, Hey, get on the ground. He stops. He looks at me and like, we just locked eyes and we we're probably like three feet at four feet away from each other. And I thought he was going to just get down. Like as far as you and I are. Yeah. Like, dude, close. like fucking close. Yeah. And I'm just like, get on the ground. And he just stares at me and it had this weird look in his eyes and I'm like, what the fuck? And so then he turns around and he starts kind of walking the other direction. And I told him he's going to get bit by the dog and he's still not stopping. I get Axel out and now he starts running. Now he's running down the sidewalk. Joe pulls up behind me. I send the dog like thinking like every other time he's going to chase him down, bite him, whatever. Well, as soon as I sent the dog, he's full sprint. I'm running now towards him. And the guy, I see him reach into his waistband and he pulls out, pulls out his gun, which was a 357 Magnum. It's a big fucking gun. Mm -hmm. And I saw that thing and I was like, holy shit. And he spins around and he starts firing at me. And, uh, I felt like something slapped me in the side of my, my left side of my uh, rib cage. And like, I, I think like I knew I had been hit, but at the time I just, I fucking didn't care because he's shooting at me. I'm literally shooting at him while you're like running, running down the fucking sidewalk. Yeah. Just shooting at each other. Yeah. Um, so you were shooting while you were running towards him. Yes. And the dog has now caught up to him and I see him. He didn't see the dog at first. Now he sees Axel about to bite him and he fucking stops and he points at the dog and just fucking cranks around off right in his face. And my dog goes backwards, like out into traffic. And I was like, in my head, I thought, motherfucker, dude, he just killed my dog. And I started feeling like super guilty. Like I just killed, like I just killed my dog. You know, I just sent my dog to do something and I got him fucking killed. Yeah. 
and so I'm, I'm still shooting at him. Uh, he shoots at the dog dog goes back backwards. Um, he, the guy, like it totally distracted him. Like the dog totally threw him off. And, and now, cause now instead of shooting at me, he's shooting at the dog. And so he ends up like going up this dirt embankment towards a, a business. And I see one of my rounds hit him right in the back and he had a backpack on and I see this big burst of water come out of his back. And I was like, Camelback fuck yeah, I got him. And he's still running. And I'm like, what? Yeah. It ended up being like a metal water canister. Yeah. It fucking deflected the round. So, <clears throat> uh, you can see it in the video, this big poof of water. So, um, I, we're still, I mean, I'm still shooting at him out of the corner of my eye. I see my dog and he runs up and I'm like, no, fucking way he's like i thought he was dead and he comes running up and axel uh bites him in the calf and fucking pulls him to the ground <laughs> dude that's fucking so awesome. yeah i was like flabbergasted i could not fucking believe my dog was not dead and wow. so he's in this like um like a ramp up to this tire shop there's like a ramp with railings and shit he's on the ground with the dog and dogs biting him and joe joe now has showed up and joe's fucking cranking rounds at this guy um, I run up and I, I ran it right up on him within like four feet of him. And as I run up on him, he sits up and he fucking points the gun at me and cranks two more rounds off. And you can see they go right, right past my head. One blows a window out of a business. And then the other one hit the side of the building. And I, and I fucking dump my mag into him right there. Um, and just shot, shot and killed him. He, he goes back. Uh, and I, and the dog was still biting him at the time and I was shooting a lot. And so was Joe. And I, I thought for sure I was shooting the dog, but I like, I didn't have a choice, you yeah. know, and it kind of fucked with me. Cause I, it was almost like I had to sacrifice my dog. Yeah. So, um, I run up on him and fucking shoot him. He falls back. <clears throat> like I knew I had hit him. Uh, I retreat back to my car. My gun is dry now, so I'm reloading. Uh, you know, not knowing if he's dead or alive, like the suspect or the dog. Uh, I'm yelling at the dog. He's not coming back to me, and I've never had an issue with an out on him. Like never, ever, ever. And so I'm outing him, not coming back. I'm eing him. He's still not coming back. So I, I told Joe, I was like, "Hey, fucking Axel's. He's down." I go around to the front of the, the a patrol car that shows up, reload. I crank one round off towards a guy. My gun jams. Um, I fucking quickly handle that and then get like two more rounds off. Um, I mean, no was movement he still now. Shooting? Uh, yeah, it looked like he was like trying to sit up and we. I, I knew he had the gun in his hand still. So he was still <laughs> alive after you he was still alive. fucking mag into him. Oh, yeah, he was still alive. Yep. And so... Um, I get those last couple rounds off. I don't see any more movement from them. Uh, now a bunch of people are showing up. We're pointing to where he's at. He's kind of like behind this hedge and I couldn't really see him. And I'm like, my fucking dog's down. Um, it seemed like a, a while went by. And then next thing I know, the dog fucking kind of like real slowly, you can tell he's fucked up, like comes out from behind these bushes. And I'm like, come here. And I get a hold of him and he's just got blood all over him. And so Nate, Nate shows up. I'm like, fucking Nate, uh, Axel's hit. Um, I'm like, we got to get him to the vet. And, uh, prior to, I think during either that conversation or before, like I had remember, like I had knew I'd got hit and I look down and I see the hole in my shirt and I'm like, fuck. And so I rip my uniform off. Um, my vest is ripped. And so the round hit the side of my vest and, and stopped it. But, so it didn't actually hit me. Um, so I'm like, okay, I'm good. Like, fuck, I'm all right. Um, I dropped my uniform right there, grabbed the dog, throw him in the back of my car or yeah, my car, Nate drove and Nate took us code three to the vet. <clears throat> and, uh, when we got there, I told, they were all waiting for us and I'm just like, Hey, fuck, I don't know where he's shot, but he shot. And, uh, they scanned him, did all this shit, cleaned it up, cleaned him up. And they the doctor's like, he's not hit. No shit. I'm like, bullshit fucking check him again <laughs> she checked him again and she's like he had a little patch of hair missing like he had a little injury on the front of his muzzle yeah and uh and i think that was from when the guy shot at him point blank i think his round missed him i don't know how but the muzzle blast like fucking burned him 
burned him on his face. And that, that was it. That was the only injury he had. He didn't, I don't know how he did not get hit. So did, did he, uh, after you dumped a mag into him at that point, um, that's when you kind of lost sight of him. He, he was still on the bite. He was still on the bite. You retreated. How, how far was from where you dumped the mag into the guy and, and where the guy was in the dog and where you retreated to reload? How far away was that? Um, pr- uh, probably 15 feet. And so, but I couldn't see him. The he- there was a hedge there. I, I couldn't see the dog. Okay. So at, at some point during that time, he basically disengaged. And, and was not right next to the guy. So the whole time he was engaged on his calf during the whole shooting part, um, I was calling his name over and over and over. I was hitting him on the E. Um, I don't know if he lost his hearing. He could have lost his hearing or may have damaged yeah. his hearing during this whole thing. I, I don't know. That's the only thing I can suspect. Or he was just in such high drive that like fucking he wasn't letting go. Yeah. But um, it took him a while to to let go of his leg and then – and then come back to me. Okay. So he, he was still on the bite when you finally yep. saw him again and you're like, mm-hmm. no shit. God, yeah. He stayed on the whole there. fucking time. Yeah, that's r- fucking amazing. R- ripped his calf apart. Uh, do you remember <clears throat> uh, just for, I guess for my clarification, I, I'm a little confused on. Mm-hmm. So when you, you went to reload, you put two more rounds into the guy like from that position or did you walk yeah. up on him? No, I was from the, from cover. And you, you hit him from there. I don't know. But he wasn't moving anymore. Yeah. So I have no idea. Yeah. He got a shot a total of, fuck, I think 10, 10 rounds hit him. Wow. And the crazy thing is the the doctor, the pathologist said that um, one one round was fatal and it was right to his heart. No shit. He's got one. And I think it was when, you know, I, obviously he, when he had sat up and cranked those two rounds off at me um, and I shot him fucking really close, yeah. um, the, one of them hit him right in the heart. And that's, that's was the fatal shot. Wow. But, um, yeah, it's kind of, kind of crazy. Like I think people watch the video and they're like, what? Like fucking what? That's crazy. Like, why would you run up on him like that? And like, the only thing I can think of is number one, like I said earlier, like if I need to be violent, I'm fucking going to be violent r- when I need to be. Mm-hmm. And like in that mind frame, I'm like, I need to fucking kill this guy. Yeah. No, there were people out. He was, you know, I, the last thing I need is for him to go get to these, this restaurant and fucking kill people. Yeah. Um, I just, I don't know, dude, I was in that mind frame of just like, like, I, I, I guess I didn't even care if I got killed. I just didn't care. I was like, fuck it. I'm going to die. And he's dying with me. Yeah. Period. Is that something that, uh, that you had any consciousness of during, or was it just total autopilot? Uh, I think for me, it was kind of auto. I like, I have, I've been involved in these things before. And, um, I, I know that like, I think I've just mentally trained myself to be like that when I need to be like that. Um, so like autopilot. Yeah. But it wasn't like, I'm not just some fucking reckless dude out there just slinging rounds. Like that's not it. Like it was for me, it's controlled. It's like controlled violence. Mm -hmm. Um, like it needed to happen. And so I was going to make it happen, yeah. you know, period. Yeah. But, um, you know, Joe, Joe did a fantastic job. Like the guy is fucking one week off of training. Like yeah. we kind of talked about earlier, you know, yeah. and then he gets thrown into this scenario and he responded phenomenal. I yeah. mean, he was, he, uh, what, uh, how old was he at that point? Joe, this is only a couple of years ago. Uh, probably like mid thirties. He, yeah. he was a little older. He, you know, he played college football. Yeah. Um, he's a bigger, he's a big guy, Yeah. but, I mean, I, I don't even care because when it's a life and death situation, you could be the baddest motherfucker on the planet yeah. and you and may not, fold. not show up. Yeah. yeah. And so Joe showed up to play. Yeah. And I thought, I fucking think that's awesome. Yeah. No, it is. That's fucking goddamn. That's a nutty story. I, I hope that, uh, that we can share any of the video pictures, whatever of, of the stories that, uh, that you shared that you brought with you. Hope, hopefully we can uh, weave that in. But, um, so after that, again, I'm assuming same, same process of, yeah, well, so that was a little different because um, I had been dog. hit. Yeah, I had been hit. The dog was at the vet. Uh, <clears throat> my lieutenant's like, hey, you need to go to the hospital. Just go to the hospital and get checked out, right? Um, and the, the, the crazy thing is where my uniform was in the street, they found the slug that hit hit my vest and still have that yeah. big, big old fucking 357 Man. slug. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just gave me saved a, your life that day for sure. Um, yeah. Oh, fuck. Uh, yeah. If yeah. I, if that would have hit me yeah. or if, if, I mean, 
I think I almost died a couple times that day. I mean, those rounds went right right over my head. That would have fucking popped my nugget. But um, yeah, for sure. um, You know, it it grazed the vest and just shredded it. Um, Gave me just a big bruise on my rib cage. Yeah. That was the only injury I had. But um, so I had to go to the hospital and uh, the the chief showed up um, like media, you know, wants to go to that crap and they, they blocked them out of there. But, um, and then I was talking to you earlier about my buddy, Cam. He, uh, he is a cop at another agency nearby. Actually, the hospital I went to was the <coughs> town that he worked in. They were just finishing up SWAT training and they listened to all of it unfold. And, uh, so Cam shows up at the hospital and hung out with me for a couple hours there. And then I told you he died two, two weeks, literally two weeks later to the day of that. Um, yeah, so hung out there with him. My chief showed up. Um, after I got released from the hospital, I had to go back to the station and fucking do the whole, like talk to the attorney. It's, it's, it's grueling to be honest. Like it's, it's the last thing you want to do, you know, get bombarded with all that crap. Yeah. So, um, yeah, same, same as every other time, go back, get put on admin leave, do the interview with the detectives, the walkthrough, all that crap. Yeah. So. After that happened, uh, you stayed in canine for another year. Yeah, I came back to work. Um, I was in how for much, yeah. How yeah. much time do they give you off after something like that? Uh, usually, it's like a couple weeks. Yeah. But I had been in so many, they were like, "You're good, right?" <laughs> yeah, no, they were like, "No, the opposite." They were kind of <laughs> like, "Fuck, um, maybe you should take a little bit more yeah. time." And I'm like, I had gone through a period in my career where after my my third shooting. Um, I was, I took some time off of work. I, I had to unplug for like six months because <clears throat> I was, uh, I was having some issues that like I was ignoring mm-hmm. and I did not want to talk about with anybody. What, uh, what, what type of issues? Uh, I was having like severe anxiety, fucking nightmares all the time. Um, I just, I was not, not in the right place. Like when I was at work, my anxiety would go through the roof and like anytime some stressful call would come out, not even a stressful call, my blood pressure would just spike. <clears throat> and, uh, I, I just like, didn't, didn't want to tell anybody cause I didn't want to be that guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was struggling pretty bad. That, that seems to be a pretty common theme. I mean, in police military, any you know, type a or, you know, double a personality type of role that, uh, you know, when things like that happen, it's, uh, generally kind of viewed or can be viewed as a weakness or, you know, or like you're a liability now and not an augment, you know, yeah. type of thing. And, and it makes it very difficult, I think, for a lot of guys to, uh, you know, to be upfront about shit like that. Is, is that how you felt about it or? Uh, yeah, for sure. Like I, I, I just, um, I, you know, like in the police world, I'm, I'm sure it's like this in the military, like nobody talks about that, right? Yeah. Like you do not want to be that guy. Cause then you come across as like, you don't want to be a bitch. You well, know, yeah, that can handle it. Yeah. I, I think that's <laughs> half of it. I think the other half is just, you know, especially in the military, the, the police may be a little less because it's, it's more of a diplomatic application to, to law enforcement. In the military, it's like you're there for one fucking thing, and that's to break shit. You know, you're, yeah. not, you're not there to to talk it out or, or negotiate, friends, or, yeah, yeah or, or you know, see what's going on. It's like, hey, here's this fucking bomb maker. You guys need to go assassinate him, basically. Yeah. You know, and, and so if if you're having issues, you're not you're not an asset. Yeah, you're not. You're like, yeah, you're 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 a liability at yeah. that point. You know, and, and the last thing anybody wants to be viewed as is as bringing the fucking team down. You know, so yeah, and I did not want to be that guy. So um, I hit it, um, but it did get to a point where like I just was not. I I felt like I damn near was going to become a liability, and thank God, like I I recognized it. Um, there were some behavior changes at home. Um, did your wife recognize it? I was, I've, uh, Steph. Yeah. She for sure. Like she has been through a lot of this, most of it with me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, she did. Um, but she knows how I am. And, um, but it got to a point where I, I remember vividly, I was getting, I was getting ready to go to work one day and I just was like, fuck this. I'm not doing this anymore. I, I got my pants on and I just started feeling like it. And I just was like, I'm not doing this anymore fuck it. And I called my boss and I'm like, I'm not coming in. And, um, and I was like, I need to go get some help because I'm fucked up. And so he's like, uh, I kind of thought I was going to get rejected. 
and he's like, man, he's like, honestly, I think we were wondering when, like, it took you long enough type thing. <clears throat> so he ended up meeting up with me in a parking lot. I had to sign some fucking paper, workman's comp paperwork. But um, I think I'm like the only one that has ever like addressed this issue and like wanted to get help. And so I don't, nothing on, on the department cause they've, they're great. Like they've always handled me very well, but I don't think anybody knew how to handle that, you know? And so it was kind of like, I'm off of work now, but like now what the fuck do I do? Mm -hmm. How do I address these issues? I had no idea. So <clears throat> I think drinking and watching porn is the best well, way. I was definitely it. drinking. <laughs> yeah. God, I, so Zach, I, don't get any ideas. <laughs> so, um, I reached out to some therapists and they're like, yeah, I can't help you in that field. My, the department sent me to a couple therapists and, um, one, one guy was like, he's like, I don't fucking deal with this kind of stuff. Like you need a post trauma doctor and I'm not that guy. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck. I'm like, okay. So point me in the right direction. And he's, he's like suggested this EMDR thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what it was. So I researched it and, um, I found a couple local doctors that are like specialized in it. And I reached out to this gal, Melissa and, and, um, she's like, yeah, I can fix you. I, I guarantee you, I can fix you. And I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> uh, and no shit. I started seeing her every week and she was doing this EMDR therapy on me and I uh, fuck, I am so glad I did it. I'm so glad. Um, mm. and that, that kind of transitioned into what I'm doing now. But, <clears throat> um, so I did that. I was off for about six months of work. I felt like really good. Felt like I healed myself. Um, and I told my work, I was like, Dude, I'm ready to come back to work. And so I came back to work and then like, I don't know, five, five, five months later, I got in that shooting that I just told you about, you know, mm -hmm. I was like, God damn. Um, but, uh, a lot of people were concerned about me after that, um, uh, because I just came back to work off of being off of work because of those issues. So, um, actually I'm glad I did that because after that shooting, I felt really good. I was, I knew how to like handle my emotions and control <clears> myself. <throat> and I really focused my attention on Joe because he was new and I wanted to make sure that Joe was good. And I got him to do the EMDR thing. Just, I'm like, just go do it. I don't care if you think you need it, go fucking do it. And he did. And he's, He's yeah. thankful that he did. Yeah, th there's a lot of uh, combat vets that have gone through that. If you could just talk a little bit about your experience with it. So my experience was it, with it was um, it's not like you don't go into this therapy office and like it's not emotionally driven, you know, um, conversation back and forth. It, the, some of it is, but they have um, devices that you can either hold on to that vibrate um, or you can do headset there's different ways you can go about doing it. Um, I did both. Um, and it's, it basically stimulates the right and the left side of your brain where you, you carry your bad trauma in your brain and then the good stuff that's happened to you in your life, the, yeah. the flight or flight type stuff. Um, and it overlaps the two and the type of therapy that you do while you're in this, um, you're in the zone, I guess, while these things are going off, um, it, it overlays those and it, I like, I'm not a doctor, so I don't, I, I probably sound like a fucking idiot trying to explain it, but, but I play one on TV. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, it worked. Yeah. I, I don't even know what to tell you. Like I did not think it was going to work. And she's like, just trust me, buy into it. Let me just do my thing. I did. Yeah. And it fucking worked. That's awesome. I, I, I can't explain it. Yeah. And, and it was lasting too, right? Like it yeah, helps it you lasting. deal with the next. <clears throat> yeah. Like I still have nightmares, you know, like sometimes those will come back. Uh, for whatever reason, th those are annoying. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, like I can really control my emotions and my stress level at work. Yeah. Um, it does not, I don't feel like I did. Like it was, it was sure. last, a lasting yeah. impact. Yeah. Yeah. Like reprogramming. That's fucking great. Uh, which, so that kind of led to your development of the course that you teach, mm -hmm. uh, to try to basically set, uh, you know, other guys in your shoes up with those same types of tools. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I do this. Uh, I wanted to put together a class about, uh, well, first my department came to me and they're like, Hey, can you like do this training for the whole department about the EMDR thing and kind of like share your story? And I was like, yeah, sure. Why not? I'll, you know, they basically asked me to be vulnerable in front of my whole department, which I felt uncomfortable doing, but I thought, fuck it, I'm going to, I'll do it. Yeah. So I did. 
I got up in front of the the whole department one one day and shared my story and um and uh, after that I got a lot of people reached out to me. I was getting emails, phone calls, text messages like and from people that I didn't even I worked with but I didn't I didn't know them. I definitely didn't know them on that level. Yeah. And they were like sharing their stories with me and I'm like fuck, there's a lot of broken people here nobody knows about. Yeah. And I and I can only imagine how that is across the board. Well, so that, that makes me think uh, optimistically then if, if that maybe could become a, a national policy or, or you know, some, something, a technique yeah. or a program that's embedded into nationwide policing, like that could make a huge difference in, in a lot of guys and how they respond to shit, I'm assuming. I mean, because uh, I guarantee to, it. Like, to me, the, the, the inability to control emotions, which we're all guilty of, God knows myself included, uh, is usually what gets guys into trouble. Not always. I mean, sometimes it's just a split second decision and, and mm-hmm. you, you make the wrong one, but, yeah. but I, you know, take this recent one like that. That's probably a classic example is that, you know, Chauvin's been, you know, a broken cop probably for a yeah. number of years and didn't control his emotions that day. And, and the, the country is far worse off for it. You know, I yeah. mean, it's ruined a lot of fucking things. And, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. so do you think that that's, uh, you know, a shift that if you get this message in front of enough departments um, and excuse my ignorance on it, is there even a national police union type of thing that, that would be able to implement something like that? Like, does that even exist? No, it would have to be, a, you know, maybe some departments do it. I don't know. I haven't heard of it, but um, it would have to be like a department thing, department policy thing. So like um, so what I'm pushing for at my department and we've started to implement is um, if you're involved in a critical incident, it doesn't have to be a shooting. Um, you know, we, we get a lot of baby deaths and, um, you know, that really affects people. Um, you know, and, and EMDR therapy helps with with all of that. It's it's post trauma. So trauma can be different for any of us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it can be violence. It can be <laughs> anything sexual. It can Rape. Be, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> what, what I've tried to, to do is, um, I've brought this to the, to the department and, and making it now. So like, if you are in a critical incident, you're like, you are going to go do this. Um, and so we're, that is something that's in the works right now. And so now what I do is, um, like I travel around and, you know, be a guest speaker at the other departments or conferences and, and um, I'll, I'll debrief my shootings and do all that. But I also touch on the well, the officer wellness part of it and the mental health side of it, which is super important. And I try to message out to these departments that you have to take care of your people, yeah. whether they ask for it or not. Like you need to do something. There needs to be something in place for them. Um, just like for you guys, um, mm. like you can't just go years with doing those types of things and then not be affected by it. Like I'll, I'll call you a fucking liar if mm-hmm. you tell me it doesn't affect you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I have done that to, I've done that with the departments. I've sat down with um, police chiefs and talked about that and how that may look. Um, you know, I wonder if uh, it would need to come like top down, like from the department of justice at a national level. That yeah, said, that, like, that's a good point. Um, I think it should, yeah. you know, I, I don't think it's ever been talked about before. I just, I mean, so, so to me, like, especially given what's going on, like what better time than to even for you to reach out to fucking the DOJ at a national level and say, Hey, here's something that, that we can do on our end mm-hmm. that, that, you know, because people talk about training all the time. We've talked about selection that there's a whole host of fucking difficulties with, uh, with changing selection standards, not that it shouldn't be done, but like, to me, this is something that's, that's tangible, that's effective, that could be implemented that, that I, I, I would think that it's impossible not to ascertain that it, that it would guarantee at least a reduction in incidences nationwide if it was implemented. I think you're right. I, I personally think there needs to be therapists embedded in the police in police departments. Yeah. And I, I don't regularly like I don't care if you think you need it. You know, I, I, I'm not sure if it needs to be every couple months, once a year. I, I don't know. But yeah. you are going to go through this type of therapy and do a hard reset on your mind, your yeah. brain. Yeah. Um, and I guarantee you a lot of the shit we're seeing on the news and how these cops are treating people, it you would see a decrease in that. Yeah. I, I can almost promise you that. Yeah. I mean, um, to me, it, it just stands to reason. I mean, if, if, if you can use deductive reasoning to, to understand that, uh, you know, a lot of um, of these issues that are caught on camera, you, you can see how they're unfolding. You know, Chauvin being a mm-hmm. a classic example is that you know, like his inability to control that and and, and his ego 
are the primary reason as to why what happened happened. So, I mean, it, it makes yeah. it pretty easy to, uh, to, to, again, use that same deductive reasoning to say, okay, well, if, if you can take that out of guys like that and make it now to where he takes a second and says, you know what? Yeah. Let me, t- let me fucking back off here yeah. for a minute. Like yeah, th- his emotions th- aren't pinging out of, you know, yeah, th- then, then that, that would not have happened, you know, yeah. and, and half the country wouldn't have burnt all fucking summer. Yeah. You know, oh, fuck. Yeah. I know. so yeah. hopefully, um, you know, whether this conversation can spark it or, or, uh, if anybody listening has the, the ear of somebody that can, uh, work with the DOJ to me like that, that could, uh, you know, potentially make a huge difference. That That's not something that's like a 10 year policy shift that takes that long to fucking implement, you know, cause most things do like to change yeah. selection criteria. Like that's not something that happens quick, you know, no. um, not to mention all of the people that are that are already there, you know, that are in careers uh, that that maybe shouldn't be or, or what have you. That's a whole whole different ball of wax. But this bang for your buck, I think, is would be pretty tough to beat to at least, uh, you know, uh, have a starting point. But um, so you came back, um, you went through through that shooting, and then um, dealt with that better than the pro- previous ones. And then, uh, not long after that, you, uh, you made Sergeant and had to, had to leave K nine because of it. <clears throat> yeah. I made Sergeant in October and then, yeah, I had to come out of the unit. I'm now the K nine Sergeant now. So I'm in charge of the unit. Oh, nice. But, um, I don't work a dog. I just, um, I manage those guys, which yeah. is cool, but you know, not, not the same, obviously. Yeah. So you, they retired Axel. You got to keep him. Yeah. I got to yeah. keep Axel. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. How many dogs, uh, are you overseeing? Uh, we have five, five. Yeah, are five they all dual them. purpose? Um, yeah, m- most of them are, we have one new dog that we're going to make dual purpose. He's single purpose right now. <clears throat> and then we have, I just selected a new handler who's it, who just started handler school this week. Yeah. Um, which we got a dog, you know, one of your dogs. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to see, uh, any good stories from that motherfucker. Yeah, he better work out. <laughs> no, he will. He's a great dog. Um, yeah. So yeah, so uh, and and obviously he's not even trained up yet. So yeah. when when he gets out, he'll be dual purpose. So yeah, yeah, so. yeah. sweet. Well, that's good shit. Uh, so what now? Like, what what are your uh, long term goals? I know, you know, from when you came in to, to when you first became a cop to where it is now, like it's it's quite a bit different. I know at this point, like you're probably not going to pull chalks before retirement because of the time invested. But yeah, <clears throat> where are you at, kind of mentally, with being a cop and and uh, how it relates to what's going on today? Um, you know, there's just, so, I mean, there's so much negativity about it. Um, it sometimes it is difficult. You know, I I think a lot of us ask ourselves, why do we do, do this job? Um, you know, the best answer I give people, or I, I try to remind people, is um, you know, we do this job because, well, first of all, somebody has to do it, mm-hmm. and um, you know, not everybody can do it, right? So. I'd say most people can't, you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, it, it's like the guy that comes and collects your trash every week. I don't want to fucking do that job, yeah. but, but somebody has to do that job. And yeah. I respect the guy that does do that job. Yeah. Um, you know, so I just, you know, I try to tell people like is with all the bad, there's, there's definitely more good than there is bad. Yeah. You know, there's the few <clears throat> outspoken. Um, but I think for the majority, people do respect us. They do, they are pro police. Um, <clears throat> you know, so I, I, I don't know. I try to keep that in, in my thoughts, but, um, I just, you know, we do like to help people. Um, and like I said, you know, if, if I'm not doing it, then fucking, and who we're is? all not doing it. Fucking who is, yeah. you know, it'd be chaos. Yeah. So, well, I mean, that's the thing with the whole defund the police uh, movements that you see in, in some aspects. I'm really surprised to see corporations that get behind it, um, yeah. you know, because well, it's like, you know, po- political. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I mean, like stances that are politically expedient is one thing. But this is to me that this is different. You know, mm-hmm. this isn't a social issue like um you know transgender bathrooms or or something like that like i mean this is where you're talking about pretty significant fucking repercussions of of uh you know things that that can go on or occurrences that will happen in this country that are fucking irreversible Mm -hmm. no no doubt like it's a lot uh, to me a lot of it's just ignorant 
you yeah. know, people are ignorant. They, they don't know. And yeah. the repercussions of that is, is huge. I yeah. mean, you, you're seeing it on TV all the time. Homicide yeah. rates are through the roof. Yeah. Shootings are through the roof. Um, <clears throat> you know, to me, it's like, if, if you want to defund the police, like really what defunding means is just moving money somewhere else. That, that, that's all that means. I mean, yeah. um, it, but if you want to do that, w- why not move that money into something like we just talked about, you yeah. know, the, the therapy and, focus it more on the officers or the first responders so that they can get that help. <clears throat> then you don't have to deal with the back end of all that other bullshit that yeah. why we're even we're here in the first place. Yeah. Uh, to me, you know, invest the money in, into us and the officers or, or first responders or whoever, um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, the more, more training that we're going to get, then the better off we are. Right. But yeah. I mean, to me, there, there's an analogy that, that comes to mind as you're Speaking of it, it's like, you know, if the education system is not very good. Yeah. And it's like, well, defund fucking schools then. Stupid. Like, that's fucking dumb. Mm-hmm. It's dumb. You know, like you need to do the opposite of that, yep. you know, um, which to me, I, I don't know how that's so lost on people. You know, I mean, it's one thing to be ignorant, but, you know, to me, it's one of those things where that, that seems like such a, an easy bridge or, or uh, assumption to make or understanding to have to to realize the the repercussions i mean there's part of me that's like and i I wonder if if you guys feel that same way like there's part of me it's like go ahead and defund them and see what happens yeah you know they have (laughs) well but i mean like on a on a scale where i mean i can tell you like i i uh broached this fucking topic uh a number of episodes ago that that got cut into a clip that was all over the place for a little bit but um you know there's a substantial group of uh, or a st- substantial number of people out there that are very capable mm-hmm. uh, of enacting some pretty horrible violence on yeah. on on people yeah. that that you know are trained to do it, have experience doing it, um, you know, at at a level that that you don't see in this country. Mm-hmm. You know, you see it in other countries. You know, and so there there's part of it that's like you know realize that that if it came to that. Um, you know, you could be biting off way fucking more than, oh, yeah. than, than you can chew yeah. and, and you don't realize it, you know, is, is because there, there is a lot of people out there that, that the only thing keeping them from deciding, you know what, I'm going to put fucking Antifa or, mm. or whoever, you know, is, is burning shit down. Like, what are you going to do when a, a group of 30 fucking well-trained dudes shows up and, and fucking smokes mm-hmm. that entire crowd doing that. And yeah. there's no police to do anything about that. Like, do you, now do you still think it's a good idea? Yeah. Um, you know, because I, like to me, like it's on a path where if it continues like that, that could happen, you know, like, yeah. I mean, if you defund police enough to the point where they, they basically are not effective that like they're an in, in, ineffective or inactive, figurehead or, or fucking hood ornament of a, of a city and they don't really do anything or don't even have the, the capacity to do anything, then, then what's keeping anybody from doing anything, you know? And, and like, yeah. that's a can of worms that once you open that, I mean, you, you see it in other countries and, and, you know, ha- having been in countries where that, that's how they live, yeah. I can tell you right now, like <laughs> nobody in this country wa- wants that to happen. Like, yeah. you know, anybody who screams defund the police, go, go to a country where, where they don't have police mm-hmm. and tell me if you want to fucking live there. Yeah, yeah. It's asinine. I mean, it's, it's, I, I think, uh, it, to, to some people, it just, it's like the cool thing to do now or to, yeah. to taunt. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people are just jumping on that bandwagon. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, the repercussions of it is it's so bad. I mean, fuck. I mean, we're out there every day, literally risking our lives for community members that we, we don't know. We don't know these people, but, um, but I choose to do that. I know what I'm getting myself into. Um, and so, um, you know, it's like, I was a part of the riots last year that kicked off and I've never seen anything like that in my life. And the total lack of respect for us as law enforcement, I mean, the, the names they were calling us, uh, you know, throwing fucking M eighties at us looting stores i mean it was chaos what what was your department's position did they have one on how to handle that that was different from what policy is um like were there any exceptions made because of yeah well yeah there was a lot of exceptions made i mean when you have a mob of thousands of people i mean you're 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 handling things a little differently than than if it was just one person but um 
I don't, they, nobody's handled that before on, on that level that, that I know of. Um, so we were issued riot gear. Thank God we had some. And we went out and deployed in the major cities where it was cracking off. Um, and it was just basically keep them from absolutely destroying things. But I, I don't know. I, honestly, it was so fucking wild that it just was chaos and it seemed to me like anybody could just do whatever the fuck they wanted and they knew that and they were taking advantage of that yeah. and we were not doing anything to stop it do you um, think you could have <clears throat> oh yeah oh uh, yeah if we wanted to absolutely so what i guess is there any element on your guys then like running it up the flagpole of being like hey what the fuck like why are you yeah. not letting so yeah that's not our call that's way above our pay grade that now you're talking politics and mayors and you know, council members, um, you know, they kind of dictate a lot of the decisions that go on and on how we're going to defend things. Um, if you have a, you know, a mayor in a particular city, like look at Seattle or, you know, mm. up in Portland, right? Like they were, those guys were like told to just stand down, just, just be reactive and look what happens. I mean, um, there's also cities that that did not happen because they did take proactive measures and they, they fucking laid down the law early yeah, on. I mean, here in Dallas, there was about four hours worth of rioting before like 300 fucking people yeah. were zip tied on a bridge. And then, and then it was, that was Done. it. You know? And you didn't but, hear it. Yeah. And it did not continue and they didn't take your city over. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. Can it be done? Yes. You, you saw that happen. Um, but I, I guess just, you know, from, from your guys' standpoint, I, I know it's a, it's quote unquote above your pay grade. If there's one thing that I really, uh, enjoyed about kind of the special rate special operations environment is that you know most of the guys at least when i was in maybe it's not that way as much anymore but guys were happy to to run it up the the flagpole and say you know hey what the fuck mm -hmm. you know and and, and hold that because to me accountability works both ways you know yeah. like you guys should be able to to question the, the people that, that dictate what you do and how you do it and, and get a fucking answer for it. You know I mean? Yeah. To me, that's only fair. I mean, was that at least done or I think it was, yeah, it was tried. I mean, and, and this wasn't our department, our, our department was just supplementing these major cities, right. That were having these issues. Um, and, and so like when you go there, like you're playing by their rules. Um, but yeah, I think that had tried to be done, but I think when you reach a level of resistance at that level, like, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to do what you're fucking told to do. And if that means you go stand out there and riot gear and fucking let bricks and shit be hurled at you, then I guess that's what you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, but there's strength in numbers with that too, right? I mean, what if, what if every one of you guys said, no, we're not going like, uh, yeah. And that's happened. I hey, mean, I, yeah. the, like the mayor's house is surrounded. I don't care. Fucking deal with it. Yeah. You know, like, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I saw that happen in some cities, but um how did that I, shake out well not well when you know 300 plus cops quit and now who's there to protect it the yeah. mayor and everybody else you know so i i don't know i, I don't, don't work there but <clears throat> i don't know what to tell you i mean it's gotten to a point a little it's out of control and yeah. at what point do we step in and say we're not we're not fucking dealing with this anymore yeah um that needs to come from a high level mm -hmm. um you know, so I don't think it's going to happen in the next three and a half. I years. don't think so either. Um, I can tell you that uh, when the national, like I've worked with the National Guard during these riots, mm -hmm. that those guys are given rifles. That's it. They have only lethal weapons. Yeah. Um, I, and what the fuck? What are, are they just supposed to just shoot everybody? I, I don't. I mean, yeah. they're even like, fucking. What do we do? Um, well, don't kill them. Yeah. You know. I mean. Um, yeah, it's crazy. It's just fucking out of control. I yeah. don't know what to tell you. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a it's a powder keg for sure. With that, you know, when you've got a couple thousand, you know, National Guard troops who are not trained for that, you know, with not. with one primary weapon and that's it. Uh, you know, many of whom have probably served in Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, a lot uh, of them have. You know, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's, that's a bad fucking scenario. It's a re know? it's almost it's a recipe for disaster, and yeah. I can't believe it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, fucking wild shit. Uh, so what's what's uh, next for you? So I, what do you want to be when you grow up? Yeah. God, I want to survive first. Yeah. I want to survive my career. Um, how much longer do you have? Uh, 15 years. God damn. Man. 15 more years. I got, yeah. I mean, man, um, 
Yeah, I think if I was a cat and had nine lives, I've probably used up fucking eight of them. Yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I, I kicked off my business, uh, Showbird Con- uh, Tactical Consulting. Um, and, and a part of that is that class that I teach, Surviving Deadly Encounters. Um, so that, that to me has kind of become my, my new passion yeah. is training. Um, I like to um, go to other agencies, share my stories, um, put together trainings for them. Um, so that if they're caught in these types of scenarios, there's a proper way to handle them. Yeah. Um, you know, well, I'm going to call the AG and I'm going to set up a meeting for you because he doesn't give it. a fuck what I think. And uh, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> See how well that goes over. Yeah. I, I mean, to me that, that like we talked about, I, I think that that would be awesome to see. And I, and I hope uh, that something can come out of it. That would be, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you to, if they want to have you come teach this course? So I just created an Instagram account. I'm new to social media. I fucking, I've always been against it, but I just kicked this, my Instagram off and I, uh, it's Kyle underscore Schoberg. Um, you can find me there. Um, I have a website, Kyle Schoberg.com. Um, that'll give you my class flyer and you can get a hold of me there in my email. But, um, yeah, just through there, um, my Instagram or my website. Okay. Um, people can reach out to me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'd love to do it. I love to uh, travel, uh, travel anywhere across the United States to do it. So okay, well, good shit. So if you're out there listening and you uh, are interested, you know where to go. Uh, last question: uh, What is the best way to get out of a speeding ticket other than not speeding? <laughs> yeah, other than not speeding. Um, honestly, fucking own it. Yeah, just be honest, own it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I generally always give people the benefit of the doubt when they're just like, I fucked up. I knew I was going too fast or whatever they did. Um, it's, it's pretty refreshing when someone just owns up to their mistake. You want to just give them leeway, right? Mm-hmm. It's the people that like always have an excuse, um, or they lie. Yeah. I mean, fucking goddamn, almost everybody lies. Is, is there a, uh, a lie that sticks out as being the most fucking ridiculous? Like <sighs> somebody giving an excuse for something stupid. Uh, you had a couple other guys on your show um, who's the pants theory. You know, these aren't my fucking pants. I mean, that's so stupid. It's like that. That's like a daily thing. But yeah. um, I mean, honestly, I can't think of a specific story. We I hear this the stupidest lies yeah. d- pr- pretty much daily. Yeah, like shit that a four year old would. Come yeah, that you're like, like, fuck, really? That's the best you could do. Yeah, you're like, come on. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's oh, just um, awesome. Rock and roll. All right. Um, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, not just taking time out of your schedule. I mean, you came here to do this, and uh, we've got some stuff lined up at the kennel for you as well, right? Um, po- I don't know. Po- possibly. Maybe maybe we can squeeze that in. But uh, I, I really can't thank you enough for what you do, what you put up with, and, and for you know dragging the whole family here to, uh, to tell your story. It's, it's a fascinating one. It's one that especially right now, I think is super relevant both uh, with just giving the police perspective and, and kind of humanizing who you guys are uh, on yeah. top of also, you know, trying to paint the picture of, of people who don't understand or, or have any idea of that perspective of what it's like uh, to be in, in those shoes and how difficult it is. And, and uh, you know, I, I joke, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I, I want you guys around. I respect the hell out of what you guys do and, and uh, my hat's off to you. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for coming on. Thank you for uh, doing what you do. And uh, so I recently came across a hot sauce brand that while I, you know, didn't used to really be a hot sauce guy, as I've gotten older, I've gotten more into into having them uh, and enjoying them. But I don't like just that traditional, it's just hot sauce that a lot of kind of the big traditional brands are that uh, that are on every table out there. Uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce is a, it's a small kind of boutique brand up in uh, Canada of all places that, uh, makes a, a bunch of different hot sauces that, uh, like flavor profile wise fit with a lot of different things. I mean, whether it's eggs, uh, scrambled or fried in the, in the morning, or, uh, even like, you know, chicken or fish or beef, uh, you know, kind of some of the non-traditional foods that you would normally eat that I eat a lot of. Uh, and, and in, in the interest of trying to eat things, uh, that are, are cleaner, more grass fed, and, and frankly, just, uh, not quite as flavorful, uh, as, as some of the other stuff I, I've kind of turned to hot sauces to, to amp it up a little bit And this, uh, brand I, I've really taken a liking to. 
What I like uh, primarily about them is they don't use uh, any thickening agents or water like most hot sauces do. It's all natural ingredients with no preservatives. Uh, it's all locally grown stuff uh, in all of their sauces. They ferment the peppers for, uh, I think, 45 days before uh, being aged um, or before made, you know, for, for that maximum flavor. So it, it really kind of enhances it. Um, and they're just really balanced. Um, one of the kind of unique things about them, too, if you saw the the weigh in between Connor McGregor and Dustin Poirier, um, Dustin handed, handed Connor a bottle of hot sauce and it's his uh, version or blend of hot sauce from this company, uh, Heartbeat Hot Sauce. So uh, they've got a bunch of really good flavors, uh, again, that I, I put on a lot of different things and really, really like their product uh, and, and reached out to them uh, in terms of partnering uh, with the show because it's, uh, it's again, it's one of those products that I believe in just like all of our other sponsors. So uh, if you dig hot sauce, whether it's, you know, pineapple flavored or traditional habanero, uh, you know, or even or Dustin's, you know, Louisiana style, they, they kind of have a, a flavor for everybody. So uh, really good stuff. Awesome company, great dude behind the company and, and just a, a really, uh, you know, cool, cool experience in, uh, in working with those guys. So uh, go check them out. They do have a promo code. Uh, it's just mic drop, all caps, two words uh, for any listeners to get 20% off all of their sauces, and that's good for six months. So again, mic drop, two words, all caps, 20% off, uh, and that's good for a full six months. So uh, you go check them out. I'd like to take a quick second uh, to shout out and thank our sponsor for today's podcast, Origin Labs and Jocko Fuel. Jocko Fuel is a great product. Uh, he's got a ton of products actually within the Jocko Fuel line. Uh, the guests and I enjoy them on the show. And outside, I take a lot of the supplements. Uh, I've got some of the Origin Lab jeans, uh, boots, geese, and uh, it's just an all-around American industry. Uh, they do a fantastic job really re-revolutionizing American industry from start to finish. It's all American-made, uh, all American-sourced. Everything start to finish is made right there in-house, and they really do a phenomenal job creating the products and fulfilling the whole ball of wax. They've been a huge supporter of the Mic Drop podcast for a while now, and I really can't thank Jocko Fuel and Origin Labs enough for the job that they do for us. And so thank you to you guys. I'd like to take a second to uh, shout out our newest sponsor, which is Project Warpath. This is a Navy SEAL-owned company uh, that provides apparel with a pretty edgy uh, feel. And uh, it's a good friend of mine that, uh, that runs it out of California. Uh, and just a, overall a great outfit. Um, they've got a, a whole line of different shirts uh, one of which uh, is, is arguably arguably my favorite, which is Epstein didn't kill himself. Wonder where that one came from. And uh, but yeah, there's Hillary Clinton killed my friends. Uh, there's a bunch of uh, pretty edgy and cool patriotic sayings on T-shirts with uh, with good design, good high quality, uh, and it's one that uh, that I'm actually wearing right now. So uh, I appreciate uh, them sponsoring the show again. That's Project Warpath. Uh, you can get all their stuff online and, uh, and you know, the shipping and customer service is top notch quality product and uh, you're supporting a veteran owned business. So shout out to Project Warpath. Go check their uh, stuff out. I'd also like to say thank you to our other sponsor, Resilience Premium CBD. Resilience is excited to offer all mic drop listeners a 20% off discount on all products for two weeks from when this podcast is live using the discount code mic drop at checkout. That's two words, Mike drop at checkout. I'd also like to say that resilience is a great company uh, that works in conjunction with Trico CBD and all military veterans and first responders receive 35% off. Yes, that's 35% off for all military veterans and first responders. And that's uh, through the military and first responders program. You just have to sign up at resiliencecbd.com slash military first responders discount. Uh, in terms of about resilience, generally speaking, it's a premium CBD that I use. Again, it works in conjunction with the Trichos brand for the everyday athlete. Uh, that's www.resiliencecbd.com. And resilience was uh, really born with the founders who uh, are military veterans as well. Personally experienced the effects uh, and impact that CBD had on their own mental and physical obstacles. Their focus was sharper, mental stress was calmed, fitness stamina increased, and their bodies felt less pain, inflammation after super intense workouts. Uh, a lot of times most people and, and people are able to either wean and off entirely or significantly reduce pain management, ther uh, pain management therapy. This is a shared vision among the founders 
that this uh, incredible supplement had not only changed their lives, but had the power to provide unbelievable benefits to family, friends, athletes, fellow veterans, and ultimately the entire fitness community. So big shout out to Resilience for their product as well as the Trico stuff. Uh, we sure appreciate their support. For the listener, uh, as always, thank you for uh, tuning in week after week. I uh, can't thank you enough. We wouldn't be able to do uh, the show or bring you these stories without uh, the listeners. So thank you to, to you guys. Don't forget to choke yourself. And until next time, this is Mike Drop. <laughs>